Adolf Hitler was an idiot, and that's a good thing because it led him to make some really bad strategic decisions during World War II. If Hitler had been a little smarter, we might very well be living in a messed up Nazi-controlled world full of Hitler youth today. Luckily, that's not how history played out. As we progress through some of Hitler's worst decisions during World War II, you might be surprised to find that it was his ego, the name of an enemy, and his belief in the occult that partially cost him the war. Let's start at the beginning. When you're a genocidal maniac like Hitler, your choice of allies can end up being pretty slim. One of the main reasons that Hitler's Nazi Germany allied itself with Italy was because no one else was crazy enough to join him but Benito Mussolini. Most historians argue that Italy wasn't Hitler's first choice for an ally, or even his second or third choice, but when your entire platform is predicated on mass genocide and ruling the world in your own deranged way, not many people can be convinced to get on board. It was Mussolini's authoritarian rule and his dislike for Jewish people that made him the perfect ally for Hitler. However, allying himself with Benito was the first mistake Hitler would make that would eventually lead to him losing World War II. During wartime, you want a strong and independent ally who will have your back when things get tough and can bring something meaningful to the table. Mussolini's Italy was none of those things. Time and time again, Germany would have to bail out Italian forces as they continually became pinned down or surrounded by allies. This would cost Hitler greatly, as Germany would lose valuable resources and men whenever Italy failed its missions. Choosing the wrong ally was definitely one decision that cost Hitler in the long run, but it would not be the only one. The way he handled the North African campaign started in 1940 ended up being a disaster to his cause. World War II started in Europe on September 1, 1939, when Nazi Germany invaded Poland. Axis forces swept across the continent, securing strategic positions and decimating anyone who stood in their way. However, the same cannot be said about their campaign in North Africa, as it was brought to a grinding halt by an unexpected force. The main objective of the North African campaign was to secure the Suez Canal, which would allow the Nazi forces to have better access to oil coming from the Middle East. The Nazis had some of the best tanks aircraft and naval vessels in the world, which gave them the upper hand in many battles. However, without oil to fuel these vehicles, they were useless. Originally, Hitler left Italy in charge of securing North Africa while he focused on decimating Western Europe. This was his first mistake. Italy had trouble defeating Allied forces in the region from the beginning, and Hitler had to send his men and tanks down to bail them out. The distance between Germany and North Africa meant this would take time, but it had to be done if the Axis powers were going to control the region. Eventually, Hitler decided to send General Erwin Rommel to the region to command the German tank forces in North Africa. His mission was to sweep across the continent from Morocco to the Middle East, and once there, he'd be in charge of maintaining control of the vast oil reserves in the region. This was a wise strategic move for Hitler, but the execution was performed poorly. After some initial success, things started to fall apart in North Africa. The main problem was that Rommel just didn't have the resources or tanks necessary to get the job done. Rommel made it as far as Tobruk in Libya before he ran into some issues. He was able to capture the seaport of Tobruk, but once the Nazi forces began their advance further east, they were stopped by British General Bernard Montgomery and El Alamein. For 12 days, Nazi and Italian forces tried to break the British line without success. Hitler was furious with a lack of progress in North Africa. After a second defeat at El Alamein, Rommel returned to Europe. He complained that he should have been left with the tank battalions in North Africa, where he was sure he could eventually defeat the Allied troops. However, whether it was Hitler's direct orders or his influence over the Nazis' military, Rommel was forced to stay in Germany while his forces in North Africa were defeated. The Allies had secretly landed more troops in Morocco and Algeria. They charged across the region and eventually trapped the retreating Axis forces. Altogether, around 250,000 German and Italian troops were captured. This would be a definitive turning point in the war to control North Africa, and led to a huge disruption in the oil supply that fueled the Nazi war machine. As a side note, Rommel was later accused and convicted for playing a role in the 20th of July plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. This led to the general being given two options, execution by the state or death by suicide. On October 14, 1944, Rommel bit down on a cyanide capsule and ended his life and career as a Nazi general. There's no clear evidence that Rommel actually played a role in the assassination attempt on Hitler's life. This may mean that rather than having a traitor killed, Hitler made the mistake of eliminating one of his best generals, as Rommel is traditionally seen as a brilliant commander in the field, and Hitler's mistakes would keep on coming. The United States played a major role in securing victory for Allied forces in Europe. However, one of the main reasons that the USA sent troops to Europe was because Hitler made the mistake of declaring war on the United States first. The US was sending supplies and resources to the Allies in Europe from very early on in the war. However, they had adopted somewhat of an isolationist policy and had no plans of directly intervening in Europe until December 11, 1941. That's when Hitler made another decision that would cost 
cost him the war. Early on in 1941, the United States had not sent or had plans to send troops to Europe. Then Pearl Harbor happened. Hitler had no idea that the Japanese were going to bomb Pearl Harbor, but he'd hoped from the beginning that Japan would pull the US into a war in the Pacific. This would cause them to focus their attention on the other side of the world, likely reducing the amount of supplies they were sending to Britain. Instead of letting those events play out, Hitler did something really dumb. He started attacking American supply ships in the Atlantic and immediately declared war on the US. Hitler was delusional, and he thought even if he destroyed American convoys and declared war on the country, the US would still be too preoccupied with Japan to retaliate. However, nothing could have been further from the truth. The United States' economy was incredibly strong and had already begun ramping up wartime production. They had the men, the resources, and now the motive to fight a war on two fronts. At the time, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was still on the fence about whether troops should be sent to Europe or if the United States should solely focus on Japan. But Hitler's decision to declare war on the US prematurely made the decision easy for him. America would go to war with Nazi Germany and kick their ass, and Hitler only had himself to blame. Just to put it in perspective on how big of a mistake this was, every year of the war, the United States constructed twice as many planes and war vehicles as Nazi Germany did. The United States also had immense resources and a huge labor pool to pull from. With everyone now united under the declaration of war against the United States by Adolf Hitler, the whole country put everything they had into the war effort to defeat Nazi Germany. In the summer of 1941, Hitler would make a decision that would cost him enormous enormous amounts of men, resources, and pretty much the war itself. On June 22nd, the Nazis launched Operation Barbarossa. At the beginning of the war, Hitler was smart enough to have Soviet Russia sign a non-aggression pact, which ensured that they wouldn't attack Germany from the east. This allowed him to focus his attention on Western Europe and defeating Great Britain. However, Hitler was not smart enough to not break his own pact. He launched an invasion into Russia, which meant Germany now had to fight countries to its east and west, defeating the purpose of preventing a two-front war. This decision was a huge mistake and one of the critical factors that cost him the war. At first, Nazi Germany seemed to have the upper hand. Stalin was delusional and thought that that there was no way Hitler would break his promise and invade Russia. But this was Adolf Hitler we're talking about, and he obviously couldn't be trusted. The Germans amassed forces along the Russian border. In fact, they weren't even very discreet about it. Hitler had always planned to invade the Soviet Union. He just wanted to wait until all of Europe was under his control first. However, with resources running low and the need for a new source of labor, Hitler launched his invasion early. He fully committed to this decision, even though many of his military advisors warned that conquering the Soviet Union and fighting a two-front war would be incredibly difficult, if not impossible. He ignored them and launched the offensive into Russia anyway. At the beginning of the invasion, the Nazis were winning almost every battle. Hitler patted himself on the back for a job well done and scoffed at anyone who was still wary of sending troops into Russian territory. History has shown that trying to take over Russia never works out well for the invading force. Nazi morale was high as they marched further and further into the Soviet Union. The dirt roads were passable in the summer months and the Nazi uniforms provided enough warmth to stay relatively comfortable even at night. Hitler was so convinced convinced that the war in Russia would be over quickly that he held off on sending more supplies and winter gear to the troops who were advancing further into the Soviet Union. But as the winter months approached, the weather began to change. The tide of the war in Russia was about to shift. Operation Barbarossa was a massive offensive with three different attack forces spread across approximately 1,800 miles of land. As all three parts of the German army started to reach their objectives, they were slowed down by terrible weather, lack of food, and depletion of resources. The Russian people destroyed their own villages, farms, and factories as they retreated further into the Soviet Union to get away from the Nazi invasion. Hitler's original plan had been to resupply his troops using Russian resources as they made their way across the country. It was too long a distance to constantly be resupplying his forces from Germany. Plus, the whole point of invading the Soviet Union was to secure more resources. However, the Russian people left very little of use behind due to their scorched earth policy. When the northern offensive reached Leningrad, they thought that it would fall quickly as the rest of Russia did, but this was not the case. The Germans couldn't manage to secure Leningrad from the Russians, and resources were running dangerously low. On top of that, the Nazi forces in the south also ran into trouble. They were stopped dead in their tracks by entrenched Russian soldiers and couldn't advance any further. Hitler was furious. He ordered the middle offensive to send troops to the north and south, which weakened the middle force while not improving the situation in the other regions by much. The slowing down of the German advance allowed the Soviets to regroup. 
Over a million troops and a thousand tanks were sent to Moscow to protect the capital. The Nazis were now stopped on all fronts. They couldn't manage to take Leningrad in the north, and due to their Soviet reinforcements in the middle of the country and the changing of the weather, capturing Moscow was a lost cause as well. It was becoming more and more clear that Hitler's decision to invade Russia was a huge mistake. The Germans had not brought enough winter supplies due to Hitler's overconfidence. He also gravely underestimated the resilience of the Russian people and how many of them would join in the cause to stop Germany from taking their land. Stalin had a huge population to fuel his war machine, and the resources contained within the Soviet Union's borders allowed them to quickly resupply, while the Germans struggled to get simple things such as food and warm clothes to their troops. While the invasion of Soviet Russia was failing, Hitler seemed to lose his mind. He started blaming everyone else for his bad decisions. This led to another huge mistake. Rather than listening to his generals and advisors who knew more about war than he did, Hitler decided to make himself commander-in-chief of the Nazi army. He couldn't believe that his troops hadn't yet secured Russia. They would have to double their efforts, and anyone who ever mentioned the word retreat would be executed. Everyone who had been serving on the front lines of the war knew that trying to subdue Russia and take its capital would be a lost cause. But Hitler would hear none of it. He wanted Moscow to fall, and he wanted it bad. So he put himself in charge of the military to make sure that no one did anything rash like withdraw and come up with a better plan. Hitler was going to take Russia or lose the war trying, which is exactly what he did. He had to put himself in an unwinnable position, fighting two fronts while also bringing the United States into the fray. And he was quickly running out of resources. Things were about to go from bad to worse, and it all had to do with Hitler's next few decisions. Hitler often let his feelings get in the way of making good wartime decisions, and perhaps there's no better example than the Battle of Stalingrad, which began in August of 1942 as part of the Nazis' southern advance into Russia. The city was a manufacturing hub for the Soviets, which meant it had great strategic importance. The Nazis did not necessarily need to secure the entire city in order to disrupt the Russian supply chain. Instead, all they really needed was to blockade Stalingrad to make sure nothing got in or out. However, Hitler had something else in mind. For Hitler, there was almost nothing more important than taking the city of Stalingrad. Not because of its importance, but because it was named after Joseph Stalin, the then leader of the Soviet Union. Hitler believed that it'd be a huge blow to Russian morale and a huge boost to his own ego if the Nazis took the city bearing the leader's name. To be fair, Stalingrad would have provided the Nazis with desperately needed fuel and supplies, but Hitler couldn't help but let his feelings get involved in this wartime decision. For three months, the Nazis tried to take the city. They were unsuccessful due to Hitler's obsession with conquering Russia on all fronts rather than focusing his troops on one location. The Nazis even had taken much of the oil fields and resource-rich areas of Ukraine and Crimea. But rather than holding the line and coming up with a better plan, Hitler ordered his troops forward to the meat grinder of Stalingrad. This was a huge mistake because it left their rear flank vulnerable to counterattack. Whether Hitler realized this and just didn't care or he was too focused on taking Stalingrad to notice is up for debate. Regardless, Soviet generals did notice and they sent a force to attack the rear guard of the Nazi army. The Soviets managed to break through the Nazi defenses and surround them. This allowed the Soviets to cut off desperately needed supplies by capturing military bases and airfields as they tightened their hold in the region. Hitler ordered General Friedrich Paulus, who was in charge of the Nazi forces in southern Russia, to continue fighting or be court-martialed and let someone else take over. Paulus decided to take the third option and save the lives of many of his men as possible by surrendering to the Soviets instead. Due to Hitler's crazed attempt to take Stalingrad, which was done mostly because of the name, the Nazis lost hundreds of thousands of men in southern Russia. After Stalingrad, there was no hope of Hitler turning the war around. The Nazi forces were now retreating back toward Germany, the Soviets capturing anything they left behind and wiped out Nazi forces that got in their way. By the beginning of 1943, not only had Hitler lost millions of troops and vehicles, but he was losing the confidence of his people. The low morale of civilians and military personnel alike would cause the Nazi war machine to be less effective. Early footage of Nazi rallies show huge crowds of enthralled people hanging on Hitler's every word. However, after the Eastern Front began to collapse and the threat of a Soviet invasion loomed on the horizon, the German people started to panic and lose faith in their fearless leader. The final nail in the coffin was the failed attempt to invade the Soviet Union and secure Moscow and Stalingrad. This wiped out any remaining morale left in the German people. To make matters worse, Winston Churchill and Franklin Delano Roosevelt had just met in Casablanca and decided it was time to commence bombing runs on German soil. This led to death and destruction at home, which the German people had not experienced up to this point. It was a real eye-opener that their Fuhrer might not be able to deliver on all the promises he made, and the war might be in fact a total loss. At the end of the summer in 1943, incendiary bombs were dropped on Hamburg. 
The destruction and fire they caused destroyed practically the entire city and killed around 40,000 people. After the bombing run, approximately 900,000 Germans were left homeless. The war had now become very real for the average German citizen. It also became clear that many in the military were losing faith in the Fuhrer. Over 20,000 Nazi troops were court-martialed and executed for various reasons, most of which stemmed from their lack of confidence in Adolf Hitler. Without the trust and enthusiasm of his people and military personnel, there was no way that Hitler could win the war. The only thing worse for Hitler than having the Russians closing in from the east, Italy falling apart in the south, and military supplies running low on all fronts would be if the British and Americans somehow managed to land in France and secure a foothold on mainland Europe. On June 6, 1944, Hitler's worst fear came to be. On top of being crazy, egotistical, and power-hungry monster, Hitler was also gullible. He allowed the Allies to trick him and his generals into deploying troops at the wrong locations along the Atlantic Wall as D-Day was carried out. The Allies knew they'd be landing at Normandy, but they definitely didn't want Hitler to know that, so they used false radio broadcasts, dummy aircraft, and misinformation to trick Hitler into moving his forces away from the actual landing zones. The plan worked. And when Allied forces stormed the beaches, they met much less resistance than they would have otherwise. There's no doubt that the D-Day invasion was a gruesome and terrible moment in World War II history that cost the lives of thousands of Allied soldiers. But it ended up being successful because of the Allies' ability to trick Hitler. With Allied troops now on mainland Europe, there was nowhere to run. Nazi forces were recalled back to the fatherland as an invasion of Germany was now imminent. All of the key events mentioned thus far were not the only reasons Hitler lost the war. There were some factors that Hitler handled poorly throughout the entire conflict that led to his demise. These can't be pinpointed to a specific event or battle, but instead show how a bloodthirsty tyrant can let his vision for world domination get in his own way. Perhaps the biggest mistake that Hitler made was overextending his forces. This was such a problem because throughout the war, maintaining supply lines was a huge issue for the Nazis. They constantly found themselves in need of more resources, the most important of which were fuel and food to supply their vehicles and troops. In the initial months of the war, Axis power secured vast amounts of land across Europe and North Africa. However, this meant that supplies and resources needed to travel incredibly long distances to reach troops. Vehicles and ammunition that were made in Germany could take weeks or months to reach the front lines. Might sound crazy, but Nazi Germany even had to rely pretty heavily on horses to transport supplies to some regions due to a lack of vehicles and landscape. This meant Hitler's war machine moved quickly at first, but then came to a grinding halt as supplies took forever to get where they needed to go. If he was somehow able to quickly move the resources and his troops needed throughout the entire war, it's likely Hitler could have won. The German supply line also forced Hitler into one of the biggest mistakes in World War II. Nazi forces needed oil, and they needed a lot of it. This was the main reason why Hitler invaded the Soviet Union. If he had been able to secure oil, steel, and food from any other source, he could have avoided starting a war with Russia, which would have meant Germany wouldn't have needed to fight a war on two fronts. Therefore, it was the lack of resources and supply line issues that were the overarching cause that led to Adolf Hitler losing World War II. Perhaps the most surprising factor that led to Hitler's defeat wasn't anything to do with the military or supply chain at all. Instead, perhaps his obsession with magic and the occult was a driving factor behind some of his worst decisions. The Nazis' fascination with the occult wasn't just made up to create Indiana Jones movies. Instead, mysticism played a pretty important role in Hitler's decision-making policies. For example, the Nazis were constantly on the search for the Holy Grail, as the promise of everlasting life was a huge draw for Hitler and his entourage of occultists. Hitler and the rest of the Nazi leadership were not Christians, but they still believed that certain relics were imbued with mystical powers. But the search for mystical relics was only one aspect of Hitler's use of the occult. He actually used pretty strange practices to help make some wartime decisions as well. Some accounts report that Hitler and Nazi military leaders frequently used a pendulum and dousing rod to determine the location of allied warships on maps of the ocean. These devices have no actual magical powers or any measurable effect on determining the location of an object, including naval vessels. So any decisions made using these techniques would be as good as if Hitler had just closed his eyes and randomly pointed to an area on the map with his finger to determine where the Allied forces were. Other important military decisions were made under the advisement of astrologers, magicians, and tarot card readers. Again, there is no scientific basis that any of these practices can have a positive effect on wartime decisions. Belief in the occult and mysticism definitely played less of a role in Hitler losing World War II than the other factors discussed in this video, but you can't help but wonder how many of his bad decisions were actually the result of following the advice of psychics or in pursuit of some magical artifact. It's late April 1945. Adolf Hitler is in the throes of a nervous breakdown. It's the end for him, and he knows it. He calls for one of his secretaries, Gertrude Traudel-Junge, 
and tells her to take down his last will and testament. Tearfully, she listens and write down his insane words. His takes on all things, all of this bloodshed is not my fault. The four other witnesses in that room, as well as Hitler, will be dead within 24 hours. We'll talk in depth later about the deranged will and testament, which encapsulates just how insane he was. Hitler had known for a long time before that, maybe since 1943, that the war was lost, but he still clung on to the hope that there might be peace negotiations. Then, at the beginning of 1945, his enemies encroached further and further toward Berlin. The Soviet Red Army was intent on crushing Germany. The Soviet leader Joseph Stalin, whom Hitler had the nerve to call a barbarian, knew victory was close. In January alone, 450,000 Germans died, and in the three months that followed, 280,000 died. This was more German casualties than from 1942 to 1943, which shows you just how stubborn the Nazis were in not accepting defeat. In February, Hitler's command in Hungary watched as his men fell into a state of utter gloom. In his report, he wrote, Amid all these stresses and strains, no improvement in morale or performance is visible. The numerical superiority of the enemy, combined with the knowledge that the battle is now being fought on German soil, has proved very demoralizing for the men. German people ran from their homes as the Soviets moved in. One woman wrote, The world is a very lonely place without family, friends, or even the familiarity of a home. In April, a Russian soldier wrote to his beloved back home, saying, At first the fascists fought back fiercely, but they could not endure this hell. Everything is bound to finish soon. On April 16th, Soviet forces had invaded Berlin, finally. Inhabitants heard the gunfire not far off in the distance. Some people ran to the shops to get what remained of food. One of them, Ruth Andreas Friedrich, poetically wrote, Before us lies the endless city, black in the black of night, cowering as if to creep back into the earth, and we are afraid. The Nazis still relentlessly kept on killing. They emptied jails and shot those who resided there. German firing squads killed scores of people deemed a non-supporter of the regime. POWs and concentration camp prisoners were lined up and massacred. The order given by Hitler was to keep going. But Berlin was doomed, with now even the Hitler youth fighting toe-to-toe -to -toe with the enemy. One woman explained what she saw, saying there were young baby faces peeping out beneath oversized steel helmets, and that it was frightening to hear their high-pitched voices. She said this went against human nature, and nothing could be better accredited to the madness of war. You might wonder why so many people fought on in Germany. The historian Max Hastings wrote in his book Inferno that the Germans were well aware of the fact that they would be given no mercy from the Red Army. It was a matter of fighting back or being murdered. The Russians had been on the wrong end of so much savagery themselves, they weren't in the mood for sparing the enemy, which as they saw it was all of Germany. Still, the atrocities committed on German civilians can't be ignored. One woman starkly summed it up, saying, It can't be me this is happening to, so I'm expelling it all from me. It was during these last few days of barbarity that Hitler sat in his bunker under the Reich Chancellery. After hearing of the death of US President Roosevelt on April 12th, he'd actually held out some hope that the new president, Harry Truman, would sign a peace treaty. That didn't happen, of course. Hitler suffered a breakdown on April 22nd when he heard that his orders for a counterattack hadn't been followed through. He screamed and cursed the people he said had betrayed him. It was on this day that Hitler finally admitted to himself that all was lost. This was two days after his birthday, which you can understand didn't involve much celebration. He did, however, make this his last public appearance to congratulate some Hitler youth who were ready to die for him. He was in such a state, he had to keep one of his shaking hands clasped behind his back. He then went back to the bunker, knowing his life would soon be over. It was there that he would be married to his mistress, Eva Braun. We know that in the last day or two, one of the many things that occupied her mind was hiding her precious jewelry. In her last letter to her friend Herta Ostermeyer, she wrote, On no account must Heise's bills be found. What should I say to you? I cannot understand how it should have come to all this, but it is impossible anymore to believe in God. Many of Hitler's inner circle made their plans to escape Berlin. Second in command, Hermann Göring, was one of them. Göring had told Hitler on his birthday that he had business to take care of and he needed to go over to southern Germany. That much was true, he was trying to ship his stolen art treasures out of Berlin. So like Braun, he was worried about losing things of monetary value. Not long after, it would get back to Hitler that Göring had spoken to the enemy. This infuriated Hitler, and it would make Göring a prominent feature in his will. Martin Bormann, Hitler's private secretary in the Nazi party chancellery, was one of the inner circle to stay behind in the bunker. He'd later flee after seeing the end of his leader, but he'd be dead soon enough too. Then there was the propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels, who was also there those last few days. He would be made Chancellor of Germany, but in the end he, his wife, and six kids would all be lost in that bunker. As Berliners were suffering unimaginable torments that late April, Goebbels made one final announcement. He said, I call on you to fight for your city. 
Fight with everything you've got for the sake of your wives and your children, your mothers and your parents. Your arms are defending everything we have ever held dear and all the generations that will come after us. Be proud and courageous, be inventive and cunning. How both he and Hitler could still ask people to fight in the face of certain laws was a testament to their egoism and insanity. Then on April 27th, Hitler got word that another of his closest had betrayed him. He heard through a BBC report that Reichsfuhrer SS Heinrich Himmler had tried to negotiate a surrender with the enemy. Hitler raged like he'd never raged before. To him, that meant one thing, treason. Hitler ordered the arrest of Himmler, after which Himmler went into hiding. He too didn't survive many more days. It was true though what Hitler had heard. Himmler had attempted to negotiate peace. Hitler's world was falling apart, but he still decided that there was still time to get married. At the stroke of midnight on April 28th, Hitler and Eva Braun tied the knot. Both Goebbels and Bormann were there at the ceremony, but as you can imagine, with the Red Army just around the corner, it wasn't the merriest of affairs. If there was any kind of event, it only involved having a wedding breakfast with booze, lots of booze. At some point, Braun signed off on the marriage certificate and she wrote Eva B only to cross out the B and then write Hitler. She was now proudly Eva Hitler, but she wouldn't get much time to enjoy the marriage. Hitler's barber, August Wollenhaupt, would usually trim his mustache at around 11 am. This was also usually the time that his valet Heinz Linga would visit him each morning. Linga would act as a kind of referee, saying the German for on your marks while holding a stopwatch. After that, Hitler would get ready as quickly as possible as if playing a child's game. Then Linga would pass Hitler his spectacles and the morning newspaper. One of those days close to his death, Hitler wasn't exactly in a great mood. He looked at Linga seriously and said, you must never allow my corpse to fall into the hands of the Russians. They would make a spectacle in Moscow out of my body and put it in waxworks. Linga also gave Hitler some cocaine drops for his painful right eye. He also handed him some pills for a flatulence problem. Hitler had many health problems close to the end, for which he took something like 28 different medications. In fact, he was starting to look like a man on the verge of dying from natural causes. Hitler youth, who later escaped the bunker, described what the Fuhrer looked like during those final days. He said, he was like a ghost. He didn't seem to see me or anyone. He just stared ahead, lost in thought. At that moment, the bunker was shaken by a strong tremor as a bomb hit. Dirt and mortar trickled down on us, but he made no attempt to brush it off. He looked so much more unhealthy than 10 days earlier at his birthday reception when I had first met him. It looked like he was suffering from jaundice. His face was shallow. It was around this time that Hitler had heard the news about the death of the Italian fascist leader Benito Mussolini. He had been summarily executed, which could only mean one thing to Hitler. He too, he knew, would very likely suffer a similar fate. Even worse, he heard that Mussolini along with his dead mistress had been dumped like dead cattle in Milan's Palazzo Loreto. There the crowd spat on their bodies before hanging them up by meat hooks. Hitler then heard that the Dachau concentration camp had fallen to the hands of the Americans. He very likely heard what happened there. The US soldiers had been so appalled to what they saw, they gave no quarter to the German soldiers they captured. Lieutenant Colonel Felix L. Sparks later said the smell of death was overpowering. What those soldiers witnessed was human cruelty on another level. It may never be known what happened on that day. Some reports say US soldiers massacred 520 Germans, but other reports say the number was as low as 50. After an investigation, it was ruled that while international law had been breached, in the light of the conditions which greeted the eyes of the first combat troops, it is not believed that justice or equity demand that the difficult and perhaps impossible task of fixing individual responsibility now be undertaken. Hitler, on hearing the news in his bunker, likely thought about this violent retribution while the image of the dead Mussolini and his mistress were still in his mind. Also in the distance, he knew the Soviet army was laying waste to his city. It was around this time that Hitler called that secretary Traudel Junga. She would die an old woman in 2002 and always said she wasn't aware of the depth of Nazi atrocities. She also admitted she loved her dear leader, something in later life that gave her cause to feel guilty. She once said, I admit, I was fascinated by Adolf Hitler. He was a pleasant boss and a fatherly friend. I deliberately ignored all the warning voices inside me and enjoyed the time by his side, almost until the bitter end. It wasn't what he said, but the way he said things and how he did things. She said, Hitler made it clear to everyone in the bunker that the one thing that he could not allow was his body to fall into the hands of the encroaching Soviets. As for the writing of his will, Junga had woken up from her usual nap around 11 pm. After that, she went to see Hitler as she would usually drink tea with him at that time. Hitler's vegetarian cook, Fraulein Constance Manzaili, also attended the tea drinking sessions. But that night, when she knocked at the door, something was different. Hitler said to her, have you had a nice little rest, child? She replied, yes, I've slept a little. Hitler said, come along, I want to dictate something. One thing he told her was that he wanted his body to be cremated. 
He said he wanted his art collection to go to a gallery in the town of Linz, which he called his hometown. As for the little things of perhaps more sentimental value, or what he called items for the maintenance of a modest, simple life, they should go to relatives and his faithful workers. Anything else of value, he said, should go to the National Socialist German Workers' Party. Here's a snippet from his testament, word for word. Since I did not think I should take responsibility for entering into marriage during the years of combat, I have decided now, before termination of my life on this earth, to marry the woman who, after many years of true friendship, entered voluntarily into this already almost besieged city to share my fate. She goes to death with me as my wife, according to her own desire. He then went for a bit talking about how he'd given his life to the service of his country, saying he had not intended to go to war in 1939. He said of the reason for the war, it was desired and provoked entirely by those international statesmen who were either of Jewish origin or worked in the Jewish interest. He had the gall to add, the responsibility of the outbreak of this war cannot rest on me. He even said history won't blame him for the bloodbath of the war but will blame international Jewry and its assistance. The British, she said, were offered a solution to what he called the Polish-German problem, but the responsible circles in English politics wanted war. He then called out Himmler and Goring as traitors and wrote down a list of names who should fulfill certain positions. His final words, above all, I obligate the leadership of the nation and its followers to the most minute observation of the radical laws and to pitiless resistance against the universal prisoner of all people, international Judaism. Given at Berlin, 29th of April, 1945, 4 a.m., Adolf Hitler. There were four witness names, Goebbels, Bormann, Bergdorf, and Krebs. All four would soon be dead. Sometime later, while Hitler's SS bodyguards were destroying all the documents around the bunker, doctors followed orders and poisoned his much-loved Atlassian dog, Blondie. Braun's spaniel was also forced into the afterlife. It was around this time someone heard Braun say, I would rather die here, I do not want to escape. A lot of silent handshaking took place as Hitler looked for the last time into the eyes of people that had supported him. It seems that Braun's last words were to the secretary Junga, who accepted the gift of a coat. With it, she heard the words, take my fur coat as a memory, I always like well-dressed women. It was Goebbels that announced the death of Hitler, stating in a message that the time of death was 3.30 p.m., April 30th. Hitler and Braun were subsequently cremated in the garden of the Reich Chancellery as Soviet artillery could be heard close by. Goebbels and Bormann soaked the bodies in petrol and lit them, after which they gave the Nazis salute. The fighting didn't just stop after that. As an observer of this extra bloodshed, a British lieutenant named David Fraser remarked, there is still too much vile cruelty in the world for us to be able to say with true satisfaction good is victorious. Let's hope nothing like it ever happens again. Clickbait, misinformation, so-called fake news. If 2020 felt a bit like a propaganda nightmare, it's nothing compared to the terrifying power of Hitler's propaganda machine. Carefully orchestrated propaganda campaigns allowed Hitler and the Nazis to sow hatred, encourage violence, and get away with unimaginable atrocities. Life in Germany after the First World War was bleak. After losing the war and being made to sign the harsh Treaty of Versailles, Germany was forced to relinquish huge amounts of territory and the country fell into a deep recession. Unemployment was sky high and inflation was running rampant. In 1914, before the war, a loaf of bread cost the equivalent of 13 cents. By the end of the war in 1919, the cost had doubled to 26 cents. By 1922, three years after the war had ended, a loaf of bread cost $700. But things would get so, so much worse in the post-war years. By the end of 1923, the price of bread had skyrocketed to the equivalent of $100 billion. The economy had collapsed and the German currency had become worthless, unable to feed their families or make ends meet. Morale among the German population plummeted. This astounding reversal of fortunes for the once mighty nation created the perfect conditions for the Nazis to rise to power. The National Socialist Party, or the Nazis, came to power in 1933 and Hitler wasted no time in implementing his devious plans to restore Germany to its former glory. Over the next few years, he began to rebuild the German military in direct violation of the Versailles Treaty, attempted to boost morale by praising the German people as a superior race, and blamed all of Germany's problems on so-called traitors like communists, Jews, and other minorities. In 1939, with the invasion of Poland, Hitler launched the Second World War and implemented his brutal final solution to what he called the Jewish problem. It was estimated that 5 to 6 million Jews, up to two-thirds of all Jews living in Europe before the war, were starved, tortured, used as slave labor, and systematically murdered in Nazi death camps like Auschwitz during the Holocaust. How was Hitler able to get away with such unimaginable atrocities? The truth is that none of it would have been possible without Hitler's propaganda machine. 
Within weeks of the Nazis taking power, Hitler established the Ministry for Popular Enlightenment and Propaganda to spread National Socialist ideas, and he was very clear about the ministry's purpose. In 1924, Hitler was quoted as saying that propaganda's task is not to make an objective study of the truth insofar as it favors the enemy and then set it before the masses with academic fairness. Its task is to serve our own right always and unflinchingly. At the head of this all-important ministry was a man named Josef Goebbels. Goebbels was a gifted speaker and a talented propagandist, and he would go on to be the man largely responsible for the German people's favorable opinion of the Nazi regime. The Nazis' propaganda campaigns were so successful because they targeted the weaknesses and aspirations of different classes of Germans. Under Goebbels' direction, the ministry crafted unique messages for different audiences and used advanced advertising techniques for the day to spread their nefarious ideas throughout German society. The military rearmament campaign was a clear violation of the Versailles Treaty, but also created many jobs in a struggling economy and helped the Nazis secure the support of the working classes. Messages targeting business owners who had suffered after the war placed the blame for all of Germany's recent troubles on communists and Jews and claimed that Germany had been stabbed in the back and betrayed by foreign aggressors after World War I. The key themes of propaganda targeting the middle and upper classes focused on the supposed purity and racial supremacy of the German people. Nazi propaganda infiltrated all areas of German life, from education and industry to science and entertainment, and the ministry used all forms of media to spread their messages and present Germany as the defender of Western culture. Art and radio and music and film and theater were all harnessed to further the Nazis' agenda. Everything from the Nazis' uniforms to the party's strict hierarchy echoed a strong military theme and appealed to Germans who wanted to regain the country's former glory as a military power. War was glorified as a way for the Germans to avenge themselves against their enemies, and a propaganda campaign rebranded the post-war years as part of a 30 years war, one that started in 1914 with the onset of World War I, and one that wouldn't end until Germany was victorious and restored to its former glory. Painted in this light, the Nazis were able to convince the German public that their enemies were planning to attack them at any moment, and the Nazis were able to claim that the invasion of Poland at the start of World War II was simply an act of self-defense. This militaristic theme was on prominent display during the many rallies held by Hitler. Nazi party rallies were held annually in Nuremberg to display the power and might of the Nazi regime and gain popular support for the party. Often lasting for more than a week, thousands of spectators would flood the fairgrounds to attend folk festivals and watch parades of specially selected SS and military troops who best represented the Aryan ideal as they marched through the grounds turning to Hitler who was situated at the very top of the massive grandstands to recognize him with the signature Nazi salute. The Nazis knew that it wasn't enough to convince the adult Germans to follow them, they had to target the next generation of Germans and turn them into devoted Nazis too. In 1937, Hitler outlawed the Boy Scouts and all other youth groups except for his own version, the Hitler Youth. Under the guise of typical scouting activities like hiking, camping, and survival training, the Hitler Youth was a way for the Nazis to remove children from the influence of their parents and indoctrinate them into their anti-Semitic ideology. The program was so effective that many children would denounce their parents or even report them for behaving in ways the Nazis considered unacceptable, such as being tolerant towards Jews. The real goal of the Hitler Youth, though, was to create more soldiers for the German army, and over time the boys' branch of the group became more and more militaristic training young boys to march, handle weapons, and prepare for war. The Nazis had complete power over German newspapers and were able to control what news the German people read. They used newspapers like Die Stürmer, the attacker, to further their anti-Semitic agenda, especially in periods prior to the passage of anti-Semitic legislation. Before the 1935 Nuremberg race laws were enacted, the Nazis used newspapers extensively to gain acceptance or at least tolerance of their new racist policies. Under the new laws, anyone with three or four Jewish grandparents, regardless of whether they were practicing Judaism or self-identified with their Jewish roots, were excluded from citizenship, denied political rights, and forbidden from marrying anyone of German blood. Graphic cartoons in Die Stormer portrayed Jews as hideous and frightening subhuman enemies of the German people, obsessed with money, sex, and power. The Nazis were portrayed as simply stepping in to restore order, and the German people were encouraged to stand aside and passively accept their horrible treatment of Jews. One of the Nazis' greatest propaganda weapons was the film industry. The Nazis were suspicious at first since they thought that the film industry was controlled by Jews, but Goebbels saw the opportunity to influence the thoughts and beliefs of the German people through film. 
He purged the industry of undesirables and offered high-profile positions and unlimited resources to those who were loyal to the Nazi cause. Some films focused on depicting Germans as racially, culturally, and militarily superior and glorified the Nazi party. One of Goebbels' favorite directors was Leni Riefenstahl, and she directed many films for the Nazis, including Triumph of the Will, an aesthetically pleasing film covering the 1934 Nazi Party rally. Other films had a darker theme. The Eternal Jew, directed by Fritz Hippler, demonized the Jewish people as subhuman, wandering cultural parasites who were bent on destroying German culture. In the years leading up to the start of World War II, the Nazis were making little effort to hide their violations of the Versailles Treaty and were being incredibly blatant about their horrific ideas and plans. So why did no one stop them? In short, their propaganda machine was working just as hard outside of Germany as it was within the country. In the days before the internet, it was much easier for governments to control the narrative and take charge of what outsiders were allowed to see about the inner workings of their country. They took steps to mislead foreign governments into thinking the Nazis were simply making reasonable demands to rebuild their country, while downplaying their anti-Semitic rhetoric and increasingly violent treatment of Jews. Just three years before the onset of World War II, Nazi Germany hosted the 1936 Olympic Games, inviting the world into their country in the midst of their remilitarization and anti-Semitism. This event was yet another grand propaganda campaign designed to fool the world and bolster the German people. Though Jewish German athletes were forbidden to compete in the games, the Nazis toned down their anti-Semitic rhetoric in the papers and radio, and they cleaned up their cities, removing Jews unwelcome signs and blatantly racist posters. Visiting athletes and delegates were blissfully unaware of the true extent of the Nazis' hatred for the Jews and their increasingly violent treatment of them. Beloved Nazi film director Leni Riefenstahl filmed the entire event for use as pro-German and pro-Nazi propaganda in the months and years to come, showcasing the Nazis as heroic leaders who had turned their country around and had shown the world how superior the German people were. Later, as World War II dragged on, the world finally began hearing whispered rumors of the atrocities being committed in Nazi concentration camps. The propaganda machine once again went to work to quash these reports. The Nazis went so far as to allow the International Red Cross to visit one of these camp ghettos, inviting representatives to tour the Theresienstadt camp in modern Czech Republic. There, Red Cross officials saw a respectable, if crowded, ghetto where Jewish residents were treated benevolently, fed adequately, and put to work under humane conditions. The Nazis even made a film about the camp to reassure the German public that nothing sinister was going on. But it was all lies. In reality, the camp had undergone an extensive beautification campaign prior to the visit, and as soon as filming was over, the cast, aka the prisoners, were rounded up and shipped off to the notorious Auschwitz death camp for extermination. Thankfully, in the end, the Nazis lost World War II, and both Hitler and Goebbels committed suicide in an underground bunker to avoid being held accountable for their crimes. In the aftermath of the war, the reality of the atrocities committed in the Nazi death camps were made known to the world so that, hopefully, we can avoid repeating them. Understanding propaganda is the first line of defense against ever again allowing a brutal and hateful dictator to commit such horrible crimes. It may have been easier to control the message in the 1930s, but the internet age presents its own challenges when it comes to fake news, disinformation, and propaganda. According to Simon Fraser University in Canada, there are some simple steps we can all take to spot propaganda and avoid falling victim to it. In the immediate aftermath of a big news event, the news outlets will always get it wrong. Wait for more information. Don't trust anonymous sources or sources that only cite other news outlets and take the time to compare multiple sources. Pay close attention to the language used by media outlets. For example, the phrase, we are getting reports, could mean anything at all. And finally, some of this is on us. Beware of reflexive sharing. Don't share sensational news on social media based on your first reaction. Do your due diligence before hitting that share button. Following these steps can help to ensure that nothing like Hitler's propaganda machine can be allowed to manufacture outrage, sow hatred, and incite violence ever again. The year is 1936. World War II looms on the horizon. Edward VIII becomes King of England and 11 months later abdicates the throne. The very next year, this member of the British royal family meets with a newly appointed German Chancellor, Adolf Hitler. Declassified evidence now suggests that Edward VIII might have been closer to members of the Nazi party than we ever realized. Under the best of circumstances, a duke spending time with Hitler and other Nazi officials is not something the British government would want the world to know about. The fact that a former king and then Duke of Windsor was in communication with Nazis just before World War II would have been devastating. So British and other allied leaders did the only thing they could. They buried the truth. Until now. 
We know without a doubt that a meeting between Edward VIII and Adolf Hitler occurred on October 22, 1937. But what did they talk about? And was this member of the royal family a Nazi sympathizer? Edward was no longer king when he met with Hitler. Instead, he was the Duke of Windsor. He remained in the public spotlight as a member of the royal family along with his wife, the Duchess of Windsor, Wallace Simpson. Although no longer king, Edward still had connections and influence in certain aspects of British society. As World War II was all but inevitable, the leadership of Britain was rightfully nervous that one of the members of the royal family was becoming a little too close to the dictator of Germany. Edward and his American wife, whom he abdicated the throne to marry, were welcomed with open arms by the Fuhrer and his supporters. There was most likely talk within the Nazi party about building a relationship with the Duke. This connection might have served them well down the road. And as more and more evidence is coming to light, it seems that Hitler not only wanted to build a relationship with Edward VIII, but might have had plans of reinstating him as a puppet King of England if Germany defeated Britain in the coming war. Once Edward and Wallace arrived in Germany, the Nazis rolled out the red carpet. They were treated to lavish parties and had dinners with the heads of the Nazi party, including Hermann Göring and Joseph Goebbels. But the highlight of their visit was meeting the Fuhrer himself. Edward and his wife were driven to Adolf Hitler's country home in the Bavarian Alps, named Berghof. Once at the estate, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor and Nazi leaders posed for pictures. Then Hitler and Edward had a meeting in secret where they might have discussed the future and what it would hold for each of them. There are varying accounts about this meeting. Some say that Edward criticized Hitler's policies, while others say he supported them. What was uncovered after the war suggests the latter might have been true. Once everyone had their afternoon tea, Edward and Wallace departed Berghof and headed back to England. Many accounts suggest they enjoyed themselves and even were in awe of the Fuhrer and the Nazi party. The couple had been in Germany for close to two weeks when they arrived at each new destination and they were greeted by cheering crowds. Many people greeted Edward himself with a Nazi salute. The unsettling thing was that Edward would often return the salute. Obviously, this was not the type of behavior that the British government would want the Duke of Windsor to be engaging in, but it didn't seem like Edward cared. Although the photos and visits with Nazi leaders do not definitively prove that there was a friendship between the Duke of Windsor and Hitler, certain documents recovered at the end of the war might suggest this was the case. But let's start at the beginning, with Edward VIII's childhood. To understand how pro-Nazi the Duke might have been, we need to go back in time. In his youth, Edward VIII was known to be fond of the German language and culture. This in and of itself is not completely surprising since until World War I the royal family's full last name was saxe coburg gotha This was changed to Windsor, as the original name had clear German origins, which during World War I the royal family did not want to be associated with. Regardless of how the rest of the royal family felt, Edward was fascinated by his German roots. He was close with his German cousins and enjoyed experiencing their culture. As he grew older, he became a little too bold with his support of what was happening in Germany. Edward was documented saying some pretty unsettling things as the Nazi party came to power. This was long before his meeting with Hitler and Nazi officials. In July 1933, three years before he became the King of England, Edward paid a visit to Kaiser Wilhelm II's grandson, Prince Louis Ferdinand. During their time together, Edward was recorded as saying that it was no business of ours to interfere in Germany's internal affairs, either regarding Jews or anything else. This alone is disturbing, as it would appear that Edward was indifferent to the persecution of the Jewish people that was already beginning. However, what he later said was even more disconcerting. During the same visit, Edward VIII was documented as saying, dictators are very popular these days. We might want one in England before long. You can understand why the leadership of Britain would be wary of this young royal family member, especially when war with the Germany was looking more and more like a reality. In 1936, when Edward VIII became king after his father's death, the British government started to panic. Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin ordered MI5 to begin a surveillance campaign to keep tabs on the new king and his relationship with the Nazi party in Germany. Edward's phones were tapped and his Scotland Yard security detail fed information back to MI5 so that if Edward ever decided to throw his full support behind Germany, he could be stopped. Once war broke out, extra surveillance was placed on Edward VIII. The government felt he was a huge liability that needed to be dealt with. It was actually Winston Churchill who took serious action to make sure that the Duke of Windsor did not become more of a problem than he already was. While under surveillance, Edward's telegrams and cables to Nazi party members were recorded and kept classified. Churchill and other members of the British government did not want the world to learn about the Duke's connection with the Nazis for obvious reasons. In fact, Prime Minister Churchill was so concerned about what Edward might do that he asked him to become governor of the Bahamas. This would mean that Edward would be forced to leave Europe. It was 1940 and World War II had begun. Edward did not want to leave Europe, so he reminded Churchill of the status of the army and how he should remain on the continent to help with the war effort. 
Churchill was not amused and clearly did not trust the Duke, so he sent him a telegram stating that even major generals could be court-martialed. Edward VIII was eventually persuaded, or forced, to agree to Churchill's terms. It is unclear how, but the Nazis found out that Edward was being shipped across the Atlantic. It seems as if they were reluctant to lose their connection to the British royalty. When secret German documents were later found, they contained a plan called Operation Willy. At the time, Edward and his wife were in Nazi-controlled Paris. They fled to Spain and then to Portugal, which was still neutral. However, this did not stop German Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop from ordering local Nazi dignitaries to seek out and meet with the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. In the documents later recovered by Allied forces, the Nazis had noted that Edward voiced his displeasure with the royal family, the British government, and Winston Churchill. The Nazis may have thought this meant it was time to recruit the Duke as an ally. It seems Edward intended to go to the Bahamas even after meeting with Nazi officials, so Rubentrop fed the Duke of Windsor false information that he was being targeted by British operatives that were planning to assassinate him. The Germans encouraged the royal couple to come back to Spain, where the Nazis could protect them, and if they helped with the war effort, Edward would be placed on the throne of Britain once again. He would only be a puppet king, but it was one way the Nazis tried to entice the Duke. Although this is not the course history took, it's interesting to note that Edward did not inform British authorities of the conversations he had with Nazi officials. Instead, they had to find out about them through classified documents uncovered after the war. This was a little shady on Edward's part. And even once Edward reached the Bahamas, he continued to publicly speak out about his lack of faith in Britain winning the war. So whether Edward VIII was best friends with Hitler or not, he definitely was close enough with members of the Nazi party to be in communication with them even during World War II. But there is another part to the story. It is the reason that this information was held from the public for so long. It isn't a conspiracy theory per se, but the suppression of information around Edward VIII's connections and communications with head Nazi leaders does beg the question, who is responsible for hiding this information for so long, and why? Surprisingly, it was not just the British government who wanted to conceal the documents connecting Edward VIII to the Nazis from the world. Churchill was definitely the most vocal proponent of suppressing the info, but he was not the only one. Churchill pleaded with the French and United States to keep the documents connecting the Duke to Hitler and the Nazis classified. Eventually, everyone agreed to keep the secret, but decades later, numerous documents were released on the matter. The reasons we know about the connections between Edward VIII and the Nazis is because of the German files found at the end of World War II. One cache of documents discovered at Marburg Castle consisted of around 400 tons of paper. Around 60 of those documents contained what became known as the Windsor File, which included German communications with the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. Recent documents released in 2017 by the British government contain information on how Churchill tried to suppress the Windsor File. He especially did not want the documents containing the communications between the Duke of Windsor and Nazi officials about Operation Willy to be released to the public. The documents also contained information about how Churchill contacted President Dwight D. Eisenhower to convince him to keep the Windsor file classified for 10 to 20 years. We cannot know with absolute certainty if any of the documents in the Windsor file were fabricated to be used as propaganda or blackmail against the British royal family, but many scholars believe that all the files are genuine and that Edward VIII was closer to Hitler and the Nazis than the world knew at the time. It's also clear that Allied leaders such as Churchill and Eisenhower hid the Windsor file from the world perhaps to distance members of the royal family from the Duke's connection to Nazi Germany. For nearly four years, Hitler has held an ironclad grip on Europe. To maintain that grip, he's poured a vast wealth of Germany's resources into building the Atlantic Wall, the greatest defensive fortification in history to that point. On June 6, 1944, American and British troops leading an international contingent of free nations will smash through that defense in just one single day. Operation Overlord, the greatest amphibious assault in history, starts well before that fateful day, however. The first step in freeing Europe takes place months before the actual attack. The Allies desperately need to mislead the Nazis as to the true location of the invasion, so that the German army will move defensive maneuver units out of position. To accomplish this, the British and American intelligence services conduct a carefully orchestrated two-pronged campaign of deception and subterfuge. Operation Fortitude was designed to convince the Germans that the Allies would send an attack into Norway in order to deny Hitler much-needed coal and iron resources. Fortitude South, meanwhile, worked to fool the Germans into believing the Allies' assault in France would come in Pas de Calais, which geographically was the preferable site anyway. 
For their part, the Germans were confident that they would see through any Allied deception thanks to a large ring of spies and informants operating inside Britain. What the Germans didn't realize was that the British had thoroughly penetrated the network, and most importantly, the head of it, a Spaniard by the name of Juan Pujol Garcia, was actually working as a double agent. Garcia carefully worked to convince the Germans that the Allies were indeed planning on assaulting Padicale. Juan Pujol Garcia's deception would save tens of thousands of Allied lives. The Germans moved large amounts of manpower and equipment to Padicale and to Norway, where coastal fortifications are tripled. In charge of the coastal defenses is the infamous Field Marshal Rommel, whom despite his defeat in Africa is still one of Hitler's most respected generals. However, Rommel and General Leo Ger von Schweppenberg, commander of Panzer Group West, are at odds over how to deploy the critical German armored reserves. Rommel believes the tanks should be kept as close to the beaches as possible in order to crush an Allied landing on site. Schweppenberg instead believes that the tanks should be kept around Paris and dispatched only when the main Allied beachhead was officially identified. With overwhelming Allied air superiority, Rommel believes this to be a critical mistake, as tanks and infantry will not be able to easily move long distances once the fighting starts. In the end, Hitler makes a fateful decision. He grants Rommel command over three tank divisions, and another three are left under Schweppenberg. Hitler will himself command the remaining four divisions, making up the strategic reserve. Without realizing it, Hitler has just made one of the greatest strategic blunders in military history. At 0 hundred hours on June 6th, Operation Overlord begins. An air armada of 1,200 transports and towed gliders fly low over the waters of the English Channel to avoid detection before pulling up for altitude. A few miles behind the coastal defenses, thousands of paratroopers jump from their planes. Others are brought in to rough landings on gliders. The Germans have identified places gliders could be used for a landing though and have booby-trapped them thoroughly with giant bits of metal meant to tear gliders apart on landing. Many gliders are shredded on impact, sending men tumbling across landing fields. Those that manage to land safely face minefields and razor wire booby traps. The men in the gliders may have been the lucky ones, however, as the paratroopers are faring much worse. American pilots, inexperienced in paradrops and nervous from German anti-aircraft fire, don't slow their planes down enough for a safe drop. As men leap out of the plane, they're buffeted by the incredible wind. Many have equipment torn from their bodies. Some land behind enemy lines with nothing more than a knife or sidearm. Yet despite the difficulties and German defenses, shortly after landing, British paratroopers capture the first critical objective, a bridge over the Kong Canal. Now, they and thousands of Allied paratroopers must hold their positions for six hours with no hope of reinforcements. They're alone and behind enemy lines, fully aware that an entire division of German tanks is nearby and having little more than a few handheld anti-tank weapons to defend themselves with. The paratrooper assault manages to cut off German supply and reinforcement routes, but more importantly, the paratroopers will ensure that the landing forces have secure and quick routes out of the beaches once the coastal defenses are neutralized. If they're not dislodged, the German plan to bottle up the Allies on the beaches will fail, and yet no major assault against the paratroopers is ordered. Just a few miles from American positions, an entire division of German troops have started their tanks and sit, waiting for the order to attack. The order, however, never comes as aides back in Berlin are too scared to wake Hitler up in the middle of the night. This will prove disastrous for the Germans. At 6 a.m., a flotilla of landing ships makes their way to the shore. The German positions have been thoroughly pounded by preparatory naval and aerial bombardment, delivering untold devastation to the German positions. However, in some sectors, such as Omaha Beach, the aerial bombardment has largely missed its intended targets. Omaha Beach will soon become the bloodiest front in the battle to take Europe. The weather is not optimal for a landing, with high winds and rough seas working against the invasion force. This same weather has granted the Allies the element of surprise, yet proves to be a formidable foe in itself. Allied landing craft struggle against the currents and waves, with many forced hundreds of meters off course. At Gold Beach, the aerial attack has failed to neutralize one of the main German defensive positions, leaving infantry assaulting the beach exposed to withering machine gun and cannon fire. Some landing craft see only a single survivor out of 30 men assigned. At Sword Beach, specially built amphibious tanks prove to be lifesavers for the men on the beach, their heavy firepower silencing enemy fortifications. The infantry is able to break out of the beach relatively quickly, though a lack of armor support forces them to limit their advance into enemy lines until more tanks can be safely offloaded. 
Located in between the American beaches of Utah and Omaha, Point du Hoc is a hilltop fortified position that must be neutralized before the Americans can move on their beaches. This requires a steep climb up a cliff 100 feet high, all while under withering enemy fire from above. The task falls to the 2nd Ranger Battalion, and against all odds, the men manage to climb up the cliffs and reach the top, only to discover that the enemy guns they were sent to destroy have already been moved. Mm -hmm. Knowing the devastation they would cause if left intact, the American Rangers frantically search the countryside, discovering the guns and finally silencing them. Out of 200 men that scaled the cliffs, only 90 were combat capable by the end of the day. Yet, by succeeding in their objective, the Rangers have saved countless American lives. At Utah Beach, the men are pushed off course by the strong current but managed to come ashore in one piece. This stretch of beach is being guarded mostly by Eastern European conscripts who have little will to fight for Hitler. The veteran battle-hardened Germans who would normally be in these positions have been moved to Patakali, nearly 100 miles away. Suffering fewer than 200 casualties, the Americans at Utah Beach capture many of the surrendering Eastern European conscripts. The story couldn't be more different for the troops assaulting Omaha Beach, the bloodiest front on D-Day. Omaha holds the strongest fortifications, and while the Allies expected only a single regiment to be defending the sector, the Axis has moved an entire division there. To complicate matters even further, strong currents either delay the landing craft or push them far off course, completely eliminating the element of surprise. As the ramps of the first landing craft drop into the water, a storm of bullets meets the infantry trying desperately to disembark. Many men drown before even getting to the beach, weighed down by their heavy equipment. The tide has begun to come in faster than expected, and in large stretches of the beach, huge deep lagoons await the men a few dozen meters from the shoreline. The troops here must cross these, and a further three to four hundred meters of barren beach, giving the German machine gunners a perfectly unobstructed field of fire from the cliffs above. The casualties are horrendous, and it becomes clear that if something is not done immediately, Omaha Beach and all the men on it will be lost. Out at sea, American destroyers are desperately trying to assist the infantry on Omaha, but thick clouds of smoke make it completely impossible to fire accurately. The German fortifications are so well built that if even a shell finds its target, the thick concrete roof will render it almost completely ineffective. One destroyer captain makes a fateful decision. He orders his ship to head closer to the beach. He'll get close enough to see through the smoke and be able to target the German bunkers. The action threatens to force the ship aground in the dangerously shallow waters, but at last the destroyer is able to see through the thick smoke. Leveling its guns, the destroyer unleashes a devastating volley onto a German fortification, striking it head-on rather than top-down. Moments later, all that's left is a smoking ruin. Following suit, other destroyers risk running themselves aground and steam in close to the beach in order to support the infantry. The move turns out to be a lifesaver for the men on the beach, and many of the German positions are silenced. As the Allied troops begin to break out of the beachheads, the expected German counterattack never comes. Hitler has been so convinced that the real Allied assault will come in Patakali that he refuses to allow most of the mobile reserves to be committed to the fight. This seals Germany's fate as after three days of fierce fighting, nearly 200,000 Allied troops have now penetrated Hitler's impenetrable fortress Europe. For his part, Hitler remains so convinced that the assault on Normandy is a feint that he keeps the majority of his reserves around Patakali for a whopping seven weeks. As the Allies witness the true scope of the devastation created by the Nazi regime, shock spread around the world, millions dead, multiple countries in ruins, and a war that spread around the world. How could this have been allowed to happen? Why didn't more German citizens stand up to the Nazi regime? Well, for one thing, it comes back to one of the most famous analogies in history, the frog and hot water. If you dump a frog in a pot of hot water, he'll jump out. But if you put the frog in cold water and slowly heat it up, he'll take a nice warm bath, and the next thing you know, you've got frog soup. The Nazis didn't take power immediately and start hurting people into the death camps. They built their power slowly and built a network of support and propaganda that made it difficult for people to see just how badly things were going. To make matters worse, they didn't even take power through normal means. The Nazis didn't win an election outright to take power, and their early years were messy. Hitler originally started as a crackpot far-right activist who joined the German Workers' Party. These early years just after World War I were characterized by violence, and Hitler was even sent to prison briefly for attempting a coup in the famous Beer Hall Putsch. He got a relatively light sentence, with many of the people in power viewing him as a harmless nut, not wanting to give him more attention. Needless to say, that didn't go well. He spent that time in prison writing Mein Kampf and rededicated himself to gaining power through legal means, and he found a population that was ripe for filling with popular rage. Why was Germany at the time so angry? The Treaty of Versailles, which ended World War I, was massively skewed to punish Germany for its role in starting the war. It left Germany in dire economic straits. 
but the people had no way to take their anger out on the powers responsible. That led many people to seek convenient scapegoats, and Hitler was more than willing to provide them. And that led to one of the most successful ways Hitler minimized opposition, propaganda. Even before Hitler took power, he was working to increase anti-Semitism and populist rage in Germany and to paint himself as the only solution. Mein Kampf was full of commentary on how effective propaganda is, and when he came out of prison, Hitler went about winning the hearts and minds of Germany. He established a daily newspaper in 1925, picked the notorious Joseph Goebbels as his head of party propaganda, and led protests designed to rouse the German patriotic spirit. He even succeeded in getting the acclaimed anti-war film All Quiet on the Western Front banned. But with all things Hitler, there was an even darker edge. Much of the Nazi propaganda was designed to make the citizens see Jewish people as less than human. The notorious paper Der Stürmer, run by anti-Semite Julius Streicher, was known for its extreme caricatures and calls for violence. The propaganda film Judd Suss was a massive success in Germany, and its portrayal of a historical Jewish figure as a sinister figure infiltrating a European court led German citizens to mistrust their own Jewish neighbors. The propaganda was so extreme that people involved in the movie were put on trial after the war, and Stryker became one of the only non-party figures executed at Nuremberg. And Hitler never let an opportunity go to waste. One of the biggest parts of propaganda is taking advantage of opportunities, or making them. The true story of the Reichstag fire is still not 100% known, but many modern historians believe it to be a false flag created by the regime. Hitler had been made Chancellor of Germany, but the Nazis didn't yet have complete control of the government in 1933 when the landmark went up in flames. Hitler quickly blamed a Dutch communist activist and used it to push the idea that Germany was on the verge of being taken over by a communist revolution like Russia was. He panicked the public, convinced the president to suspend civil liberties, and gained a majority in the next election, at which point he began purging the opposition. And once he had absolute power, resistance was only going to get harder. One of the most important elements of Nazi propaganda was to get them while they're young. Children would be indoctrinated early, and parents who opposed the Nazi regime would find they might have enemies within their own homes. The instrument for this was the Hitler Youth, a massive network of training camps and indoctrination programs that essentially worked as the summer camp from hell. Boys attended summits, participated in patriotic activities, learned valuable life skills, and were told all about how their many, many enemies would have to be dealt with. And when they say, get them young, they mean it. The Hitler Youth proper was for boys aged 14 to 18, and often had a paramilitary overtone as the boys were prepared for their role in the German military. But for younger boys, there were the German youngsters in the Hitler Hitler Youth program, immortalized in the Taika Waititi movie Jojo Rabbit. It was heavily patterned after the Boy Scouts, and the young boys were trained to report on their neighbors and spy on other gatherings like church youth groups. Hitler believed that the children were Germany's future, and he made sure that the future liked to goose step. All this worked together to create a climate of fear. Many people, especially in the early days of the Nazi regime, might have disagreed with some of the more extreme elements of Hitler's platform. Even those who voted for the Nazis might have been shocked by how quickly he moved to tighten his grip on Germany. But who were they going to talk to that about? Most anti-Nazi political organizations were outlawed, kids were indoctrinated into Nazism at an early age, and no one knew if their neighbor they talked to was actually a Nazi diehard who would report them to the authorities. For many people, the fear of the consequences of speaking up was enough to keep them silent. And the reach of Nazism didn't limit itself to Germany. Many anti-Nazi activists, including the Jews who were worried about their future in the country, reached out to their friends around the world seeking support. But two could play at that game, and the Nazis were willing to play dirtier. In the 1930s, a pro-Nazi organization called the German-American Bund was established in the United States to promote an alliance with Nazi Germany. They held massive anti-Semitic rallies in New York City, making many prominent politicians and journalists hesitant to speak out against the Nazis. But one major element was about to make opposition to Nazism much harder. For the first six years of the regime, Hitler concentrated on the internal affairs and built a powerful network. The governments of Europe, hoping to avoid war, ceded territory to him to pacify his aggression. It did didn't work, and in 1939 he invaded Poland. World War II was on, and with it, opposing the Nazis was about to become even trickier. When a country goes to war, the rally round the flag effect kicks in. This causes the leader's approval rating to skyrocket, and often makes anyone opposed to the leader fall out of favor. And in this case, it didn't matter that the leader started the war. Things moved fast in war, and soon Germany was involved in the conflict on multiple fronts. Not only did they conquer Poland, but the pro-Nazi government of Austria quickly surrendered and was integrated into the Nazi 
Nazi regime. France was the next big front, as well as the growing air war with Britain. Not only was there intense pressure to support the war effort, but with the rate of the country's territory growing, it became harder to argue that the regime wasn't a success, and for many on the ground, that was all that mattered. And many men weren't there to argue at all. It's one of the biggest factors in a society during the war, conscription. The military draft in Germany had been reinstated in 1935 as Hitler built up the military in advance of the war, and his war machine was training 300,000 conscripts a year. That took many men away from their homes and left them facing military justice if they crossed their commanders. As for those left behind, the women were often forced into the workforce and were the sole providers for their families while their husbands were at war. If you don't want people to resist your regime, make it harder for them to have time or security. And for those who did stand up, harsh treatment awaited. Hitler wasn't able to put down all resistance to his regime, but those who were caught in the act often faced a court system stacked against them. The Nazi courts were notorious for their bias in favor of the regime. This was at its worst when dealing with cases involving Jewish people, such as the infamous riots of Kristallnacht. It was near impossible for enemies to the regime to get justice in courts, and those who were hauled into court often faced swift deportation to a prison camp or worse. That was the fate of journalist Fritz Gerlach, who had advocated against Hitler in the years before he took power. Gerlach was swiftly declared an enemy of the state, arrested less than two months after Hitler took power, and murdered during the Night of Long Knives when Hitler purged his enemies. But that didn't stop those who refused to bow down, no matter how dangerous it became. During the early 1940s, a growing anti-Nazi youth movement began in Munich. This gang of intellectuals would become known as the White Rose Movement, and their tactics were peaceful. They launched a campaign of leaflets and graffiti to raise awareness of the brutality of the Nazis and call for peaceful resistance. They were led by the Scholl siblings, Sophie and Hans, and their friend Alexander Schmorl. They operated for seven months until the Gestapo arrested the ringleaders. So what was the punishment for minor vandalism in Nazi Germany? The Scholl siblings and many of their allies were placed on trial, but the Nazi people's court was not a place for justice. They weren't allowed to speak in their defense, although that didn't stop Sophie from frequently interrupting the judge. They were convicted in only days and were quickly sent to the guillotine and executed. This had a chilling effect on all the opposition in Nazi Germany, as they knew that even the most peaceful opposition to the regime could earn you a public execution. Many of the resistance in Germany was highly under the radar, and one mistake could get you killed. It often took the form of providing goods to Jewish residents who were banned from participation in public life, and later hiding them from deportation forces that took them to the ghettos and later to the death camps. Houses around Nazi Germany and the nations it occupied became secret hiding places, with refugees staying in attics and basements, often for years, for those who were lucky enough to escape detection. But these saviors weren't always what you'd expect. There are some reports from the time of the Holocaust of people who hid Jews in their homes, despite being loyal members of the Nazi party and even publicly anti-Semitic. Many of them might have been putting on an acceptable public face to avoid suspicion. Many may have even been Nazis originally but couldn't stomach the switch from bigotry to open genocide of their neighbors. Whatever the reasons, these righteous genteels often survived by hiding their opposition to the regime, and those who were found out often found themselves on the next train to the camps alongside those they tried to help. There was resistance, but it often took a certain advantage or privilege. After Hitler consolidated power, open opposition to the regime was usually a one-way ticket to imprisonment or death. For the people on the ground, the only way to help was usually under the cover of darkness. But other more powerful figures took advantage of their position. Chiyune Sugihara, a Japanese diplomat, was able to print visas for hundreds of Jewish people to come to Japan and escape Nazi persecution. Industrialist Oskar Schindler arranged for Jewish prisoners to work in his factories as slave labor, thus sparing them from the gas chambers. The opposition to Nazism was running uphill from the start, as Hitler had the power of propaganda and anger on his side. It then became a hopeless fight when he turned the law, military, and the courts in his favor. For many of the regime's opponents, it became a battle to survive the era, and most were scared out of playing an active role in the resistance. Ultimately, it would take the entire Allied forces to bring Hitler's rule to a much-deserved end. The Channel Islands, a picturesque group of rocky isles between Great Britain and France. For the residents of these islands, life is usually sleepy, making them a popular vacation destination. But in 1940, they would be anything but calm and relaxing, because Nazi Germany had conquered France and the United Kingdom was next in their sights, and the Channel Islands were in the way. The small population and lack of military hardware meant defending the islands would be impossible, and the UK had no resources to spare in the middle of the war. They quickly demilitarized the island and evacuated as many civilians as they could while the German forces bore down. While a significant percentage left, the majority of the major islands of Jersey and Guernsey chose to stay and face an indefinite Nazi occupation. 
But Adolf Hitler had bigger plans for the island than a new source of slave labor. The Wehrmacht took over the Channel Islands on June 30, 1940, and were quickly unimpressed by the island's defenses. The islands weren't a common staging ground for war, and the Nazis weren't expecting to spend much time there. They planned to quickly move on to conquering the United Kingdom mainland. But Hitler's ambition got the better of him. Britain didn't go down to air assault nearly as easily as they expected, and rising tensions with Russia meant Hitler was more worried about the war on the Eastern Front than proceeding to London. And suddenly, the Channel Islands looked a lot more significant. After looking at maps of the islands, Hitler called additional forces to the small outposts. He announced a massive construction project that would take the Channel Islands from a footnote in the war to one of the Nazi regime's most fortified outposts. The organization taught. Hitler's civilian infrastructure organization was brought to the islands with the mission of providing labor and building over 200 military facilities, bunkers, and casemates on each of the larger islands. They would need a lot of manpower. And Hitler, of course, had a favorite way of getting manpower. While the Channel Islands occupation hadn't initially been as brutal as the occupation of France and other nations Hitler conquered, save for the Jews of the islands who were quickly deported, that would soon change. Hitler needed labor, and the remaining citizens of the islands would be conscripted. As the islands weren't seen as a priority initially and were being blockaded by the Allies for much of the war, resources were slim, and conditions would get worse over the course of the war. While there was some resistance on the islands, the residents were so outnumbered by armed occupiers that they never had much of a chance, and soon the Channel Islands would be completely transformed. The Nazis used a system called the Riegelbau, or Standard Build, to mass-produce bunkers that could withstand enemy attacks. Built from over 200 standardized armor parts, they could be assembled much faster than other constructs after being built in German factories, almost like the world's largest Lego set, if they could withstand aerial assaults. There were three primary types of designs, temporary ones in the field made out of timber and soil with a concrete ceiling, reinforced models with a meter-strong concrete ceiling, and permanent facilities with two-meter-thick concrete ceilings and walls. Hitler approved the plan, and one of the biggest construction projects in World War II history began. Soon, the Channel Islands were met with a throng of workers coming in to begin construction. Some were civilian workers and military members in non-combat positions, but many were taken from the Nazi labor camps around Europe and from military detainees, along with the native Channel Island populations. Supplies were brought in, particularly cement, steel, and timber, and work camps were built to keep the workforce in a centralized location and to keep them from escaping. By the end of 1942, the Channel Islands had become a massive military fortress. Sites would be excavated using manual labor, often using explosives to speed things up. As soon as this was done, the construction experts would come in and direct the labor, carefully assembling sites according to the exact specifications of the plans. There were several types of facilities, each designed for a specific purpose, and to make it near impossible for any Allied forces to dislodge the Nazi occupation. The first line of defense? Artillery. For those visiting the Channel Islands today, one of the most impressive landmarks is the Battery Miras, a massive artillery position. With massive range-finding towers and four barrels, its powerful guns could shoot a stunning 32 miles with lightweight shells or almost 20 miles with heavy anti-armor shells, making them able to gun down enemy forces long before they could set foot on the island. The powerhouse artillery position would be joined by 10 coastal artillery batteries on Guernsey alone, surrounded by bunkers that would contain spare ammunition. But they were prepared for dangers coming from all directions, including above. The islands were also filled with longer-range guns designed for taking out aircraft, with some able to shoot as far as 7,500 meters. Six island anti-aircraft batteries were set up, equipped with radar and searchlights. The Nazis wanted a clear line of sight and fire, so they looked for wide-open locations, including a converted golf course. The radars and command bunkers for the anti-aircraft barriers were fortified, with around 175 total positions, and just in case anyone got through, the island had been littered with explosive-rigged obstacles to get planes when they landed. But if any enemy forces got through, the Nazis were prepared. If the Allies got to the beach, they would be met by countless casemates designed for close-range assaults. While the small bunkers would be hard to penetrate, any soldiers approaching them would be met with multiple soldiers' worth of heavy fire. The machine guns within were equipped with searchlights for nighttime fire, but defenses were just as strong as the offensive posts. Barbed wire and minefields made it dangerous to cross the islands. Trenches made it hazardous and hard to navigate. These would usually lead to heavy fire zones, funneling the invading soldiers right into the line of fire. The 12 strong point areas around Guernsey protected most of the critical points, with resistance nests around the island providing simpler defenses. But the strongest island defenses might have been hidden from sight. 
To the untrained eye, much of Guernsey would seem to be unspoiled green, but this was often camouflage, with paint and straw being used to resemble grass and natural stones being built into concrete. And under many of these camouflaged positions would be a massive network of tunnels that spanned much of the islands. Built over two years, 14 full tunnels were completed, while others were started but never finished. They would allow Nazi personnel and their workers to navigate from one position to another away from enemy eyes. And for the most important facilities on the island, secrecy was key. Leadership and technical support were housed in underground bunkers, as well as the infrastructure that was needed to keep the massive Nazi war machine on the island running. Radar units were the top target for Allied bombers and were usually disguised with the crew working in underground bunkers. While the transformation of the Channel Islands was very visible, much of its most powerful tools were hidden. The Channel Islands mega fortress designed by Adolf Hitler seemed indestructible, but there was one thing they hadn't counted on. As the years went on, resistance to the occupation grew and Nazi oppression increased. Resistors were sent abroad to Nazi prisons, with some dying. The British government made several attempts to liberate the islands, but raids had to be called off due to heavy fire, weather conditions, or resources being needed elsewhere. In 1944, the Allied forces launched the D-Day landings and liberated Normandy, but decided to pass by the Channel Islands because it would take far more resources than they had to take on the German fortifications. But it had other consequences. Almost all the Channel Islands' food supplies went through Nazi-occupied France and that pipeline had just been cut off. The Channel Islands were starving. Negotiations began for the Channel Islands' fate, with the Germans initially making an offer to the British to release all civilians besides military-age men. Winston Churchill was unimpressed, telling them, let them starve, they can rot at their leisure. The tide to the war was turning, and the Allies only wanted one thing, unconditional surrender. The Germans refused to discuss it, and it would be several long months in December of 1944 until a Red Cross ship was finally able to bring food and medical supplies. But the end was only months away. May 8, 1945 saw the Germans surrender, and only days later Allied forces arrived across the Channel Islands and the German soldiers laid down their weapons. And slowly but surely, the population that fled the occupied islands began to return, and were shocked at how their little islands had been transformed. The Nazi forces were gone, but the islands were still dotted with their massive military infrastructure, and in the years to come it would define the islands in some unique ways. What was the ultimate purpose of Hitler's island megafortress? The Germans put an enormous amount of effort into defending a small group of islands, but it amounted to very little. They were able to hold the islands, but never mounted any successful attacks on Britain from there. They were never conquered, but nearly starved to death as soon as they were cut off. Was it just another elaborate project of the madman who met his end inside a German bunker? Or was it intended as something else? Some suspect it may have been a place Hitler planned to hide if he got out of Germany in time. A group of Channel Island residents were determined to answer these questions. It was 1961 when the Channel Islands Occupation Society was formed. A group of volunteers dedicated to investigating and managing the history of the German occupation, they took over management of many of the German sites from the British military and published an annual newsletter sharing stories from the era. Based in both Jersey and Guernsey, they are most people's entry point to this little-known part of World War II history. But they're not the only way to learn about it. Today, one of the Channel Island's biggest industries is tourism. The islands are open to visitors, and most of the most famous Nazi bunkers have been cleaned out of anything dangerous and are open to tourists. Historian Dan Snow put out a documentary as he traveled the length of Guernsey, visiting Hitler's island fortress and sharing tales of the Second World War. A German occupation museum stands in Lehuard, offering a look into artifacts and communications from the occupation era. His whole trip consisted of a six-day itinerary, much of which can be covered by daring visitors. But not all the secrets of the Nazi occupation have yet been uncovered. It was early 2020 when Snow's documentary crew explored a bunker that had only recently been uncovered and renovated. It was even filled with the original bunks for the soldiers stationed there, and the walls were painted with murals from the men who lived underground. There were places reserved for pictures of high-ranking German officials, including Hitler himself. Even today, over 70 years since the war, Hitler's island megafortress continues to give up its secrets. While the occupation lasted only five years, the fortress was built to last, and historians of the war will likely be making new discoveries for decades to come. History remembers Hitler for many things. A failed artist, his love for German shepherds, being a Nazi dickhead. Yeah, it's mostly the Nazi dickhead thing. But one thing you might be surprised to learn about Hitler is that he was actually one of the wealthiest men of his time. And no, not just because of all that stolen Nazi gold and loot gathered from all across Europe. 
but because of his own shrewd business skills. Young Hitler lived a bohemian lifestyle before it was cool, making him the ultimate mass-murdering hipster. He rented a small apartment in Vienna with a friend and struggled to get by by selling small paintings and postcards to tourists. After being rejected from art school twice, Hitler was soon out on the street, all of his funds having run out. After World War I, Hitler had become involved in German politics and famously took part in the failed Beer Hall Putsch of 1923. As a result, he was sentenced to prison for five years, and to help pay off his legal fees, he dictated what would become Mein Kampf to two of his cellmates. Hitler imagined that the book would be popular amongst the National Socialist Party and had no big dreams of making it as a writer. All he needed was a few thousand people to buy the book so that he could pay off his legal fees, and in 1925, the first year of its publication, Mein Kampf sold 9,000 copies. While this certainly helped pay for his legal fees, Hitler would see no royalties from these meager sales. However, as Hitler began to rise along the ranks of the National Socialist Party, so did his exposure as an author. More and more party members, and even some curious members of the public, wanted to know what this mustachioed young man was all about and copies of Mein Kampf slowly began to increase in sales. By 1930, Mein Kampf had managed to sell 55,000 copies in a single year, and by this time Hitler was receiving decent, if not impressive, royalty checks from his publisher. Once Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, though, book sales of Mein Kampf exploded, and in 1933, the year he took power, sales skyrocketed to over 850,000. Needless to say, Hitler was now pulling in rather large royalty checks. Thanks to his massive personality cult and the fact that he ruled Germany unchecked, Hitler decided that the best way to boost sales of his book even further was to have the government itself buy copies. Therefore, the Nazi government immediately bought 6 million copies of his book and copies were being provided to soldiers and government workers alike. Even married couples received a free copy on their wedding day, as a very weird congratulatory present from the Nazi government. But as Hitler became more popular, or infamous depending on your take, the world at large grew curious about the Nazi author. Internationally, Hitler earned royalties on the sale of his book up until 1939, when he was declared an enemy of the Allies and had all international royalties cut off. Granted, he was never earning nearly as much internationally as domestically, but he was still pulling in $560,000 in royalties from sales in Britain and about $50,000 in royalties from sales in the US. During the war, his book would continue to sell in the US, though the US government seized control of publishing royalties by invoking the Trading with the Enemy Act and ended up giving $260,000 in royalties to war refugee charities. While Hitler was trying to kill people, ironically his book was helping those same people. At his height, Hitler was earning about $13.5 million a year from book sales in today's dollars, which would be far more impressive if he wasn't basically forcing the Nazi government to simply buy his book. All those sales, though, had accumulated to a $10 million tax bill, which Hitler simply ordered one of his ministers to forgive. We gotta admit, sometimes it pays to be on top. Literally. In total, Hitler would earn a whopping $170 million in today's dollars just by selling copies of Mein Kampf. All this money was used to buy several very expensive properties around Germany, though Hitler also used a great deal of his own personal fortune to fund the Nazi party. He even made one of his homes, the Berghof, into the main headquarters of the Nazi party. Sadly, when the British tried to bomb it back to the Stone Age, their bombs largely missed and only managed to slightly damage it. Hitler, however, used his political power to enrich himself with one more other cunning ploy. He licensed his image to the German government and then ordered that it be used basically everywhere. From posters to stamps to the covers of propaganda magazines and books, Hitler's face was everywhere all across the German nation, and every time his face was printed on anything, Hitler got a cut thanks to licensing fees. Given that Hitler was the one ordering the creation of all this propaganda material, we once more have to admit that this is a pretty pro super villain move. Taking over a country and ruling it like a dictator is one thing, but selling your image to your own government and then forcing it to print it everywhere is on a whole other level of villainy. Then of course there is all the untold stolen wealth of Europe that the Nazis quote liberated as they invaded nations. By the end of the war the Nazis had stolen a whopping 21 billion dollars in gold and it was this stolen gold that helped entirely fund the German war machine for five whole years. As supreme ruler of Germany, whatever the state owned was basically Hitler's personal wealth as well, though the Allies made sure that he spent every stolen cent on the war effort lest his forces be defeated sooner than they eventually were. Still, with the largest gold reserves in the world for a short while, Hitler was likely one of history's richest rulers if 
only briefly. Today, Mein Kampf continues to sell copies. Physical copies of the book are, understandably, very rare, as most people don't want to be caught in public reading Mein Kampf. Yet, thanks to digital readers like Kindle, digital sales of Mein Kampf have exploded around the world. Part of this is due to sheer curiosity, and in some parts of the world who have learned very little about Hitler and his role in World War II, Mein Kampf and anything Hitler-related is actually seen as trendy, hip, and cool. This is especially true in Southeast Asia, with Thailand in love with anything Hitler-related. Again, this is mostly due to the fact that Thai citizens learn very little about Hitler's role in World War II, and for them he's apparently nothing more than a snazzy dresser with a funny mustache. A rise in anti-Semitism and nationalism, however, has also seen sales of Mein Kampf increase in the last few years, and that's rather unfortunate for the rest of us non-Nazi dickheads. Ironically though, because no publisher wants to be associated with Hitler and his book, or seen as enriching themselves from Nazi trash, the vast majority of all money made from the sales of the book are funneled straight into various charities. So while white supremacists are buying up Mein Kampf and hating on Jews and other minorities, they're actually helping fund a ton of charities that help those groups of people and others out. Thanks, idiots! After Hitler's death, what remained of his wealth and ongoing royalties from Mein Kampf went to one of Hitler's surviving cousins, who flatly refused them and did not wish to be associated with one of history's greatest villains. Instead, those funds were channeled to various charities and post-war reconstruction efforts. The same goes for sales of his early artwork, with no dealers wanting to be associated with Hitler, and sales largely taking place between private sellers and collectors. In the end, Hitler may have been one of the most evil men to ever live, but ironically, he would end up defeating himself as his wealth continues to this day to be used for causes that would likely make him turn over in his grave. Stefan Novak's heart beats rapidly in his chest as he approaches the Nazi checkpoint. Heavily armored SS soldiers check each person's papers before they're allowed to enter the heart of the Nazi empire. Stefan watches in horror as a man is pulled from the line screaming, he's thrown to the ground. The man pleads with the Nazis to spare his life, that the star of David burned into his arm was just a mistake, he really isn't Jewish. But the Nazis don't listen. The commander pulls his pistol out of its holster and shoots the man in the chest. Stefan shows no emotion as he watches the innocent man die. He knows that if he's going to successfully infiltrate the lands of the Third Reich, he needs to maintain his cover. Stefan has been working tirelessly to assume his new identity, one that will allow him to move freely across the European continent, which is now completely controlled by Adolf Hitler. Before the Nazis won the war in Europe, Stefan was a resistance fighter in the Polish army, but now there is no war to fight. The Nazis have full control of Europe, and Stefan only has one thing on his mind – to find his wife and daughter before they're worked to death in a concentration camp, or executed for being related to an enemy of the Nazi state. As the war came to an end, Stefan received word from Polish underground forces that his wife and daughter had been taken by the Nazis and put on a train to work in one of the slave camps somewhere in the empire. He immediately called in all of his favors to secure fake documents and uncover as much of his information on his family's whereabouts as possible. The good news is, he knows where to start his search. The bad news is that the start point is in Berlin, the heart of the Nazi Empire. Stefan reaches the front of the line. The Nazi soldier asks for his papers. He keeps his eyes on the ground as a sign of fear, even though he would be more than capable of snapping the Nazi's neck and taking out a few of his comrades in the process. But he must remain undercover if he has any hope of locating his wife and daughter. The soldier is quiet for a moment as he looks over the papers. What business do you have in the capital? The Nazi asks. I wish to give my life to the Third Reich. I was a stonemason before the war, and I know the Fuhrer is in need of hard-working men to complete his vision for Germania, Stefan replies. The Nazi grunts. Polish scum, he says. Very well, continue on. The Nazi slams Stefan's papers into his chest, slightly pushing him backward, and points to where he should go. It takes everything Stefan has not to punch the Nazi in the face, but he knows what the consequences of such an action would be. He continues through the checkpoint and boards a bus for Berlin. The bus drives through the Nazi countryside, it looks untouched by the war. The Nazis work quickly and it's helped that they now have a gigantic pool of slave labor to pull from in order to rebuild their roads and buildings. Anyone who does not conform to Hitler's vision of the Aryan race is treated as a second-class citizen. Anyone belonging to ethnic minority groups such as the Jews are enslaved and either worked to death or killed as part of the Nazis' mass genocide program. The bus enters what was once Berlin. The city has been transformed into Hitler's megacity called Germania. Everywhere Stefan looks, he sees statues dedicated to Nazi leaders and generals. Grand buildings made of marble quarried by slaves rise from the ground like mountains. The city seems to have popped up overnight thanks to the millions of forced laborers Hitler and his architects had at their disposal. The sight of swastikas and Nazi symbols on every building and street corner makes Stefan sick. The bus comes to a stop in the heart of the city. 
Stefan gets off. He has instructions from one of the informants in the Polish underground network to pick up more information on the whereabouts of his family in a newly constructed housing complex. He heads there immediately and finds a small eagle representing the Polish coat of arms etched into one of the stones of the building. Stefan pushes the stone. It moves slightly to reveal a hidden compartment. In it is a set of papers that indicate his wife and daughter have been sent to the east. Early in the war, the Nazis reached an agreement with the Soviet Union, saying that they would stay out of the war in exchange for Hitler not invading their country. Hitler had no intention of upholding his end of the bargain, but he needed time to focus his efforts on defeating the Allied forces in France. Once this mission was complete, he launched Operation Sea Lion across the English Channel into Britain. The Allied forces in Britain were still recovering from the Dunkirk invasion and were no match for the Nazi Blitzkrieg. Britain fell soon after. Now it's ruled by Hermann Göring, one of Hitler's top generals and good friends. Göring is a monster who has turned Britain into his own private island. He has luxury goods imported from around the empire and throws lavish parties for his Nazi comrades in what was once Buckingham Palace. Resources from Britain are sent back to Germany as tribute to Hitler, but for all intents and purposes, Göring is the new King of England. He must do exactly what the Fuhrer orders, but in return he has free reign of the British Isles and is quickly stripping them of their resources while oppressing their people. As soon as Hitler controlled all of Western Europe and defeated British military forces, he turned his attention toward the Soviet Union. The Nazis coordinated an attack with Japan, who struck from the west, while their forces pushed across Eastern Europe and into Russia from the opposite direction. All Hitler really wanted was the territory up to the Ural Mountains. Eventually, he would take over the world, but this would complete the first stage of his plan and put all of Europe under his control. Stefan puts the stone back in its place and heads to the train station, where he purchases a ticket for the Nazi territories in what was once the Soviet Union. When Hitler defeated the Allies in Europe, he annexed Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and Finland. Most of the populations in these regions conformed to his definition of what the human race should look like. There were resistance fighters who tried to protect the freedom of all peoples in these nations, but they were quickly disposed of by the SS. Now the Dutch and Scandinavian governments are puppets for Hitler to do with as he pleases. However, the people in the former Soviet Union aren't so lucky. Stefan looks out the window of the train car, as the lands east of Germany seem more like hell than earth. The landscape has been ravaged for its resources. Hitler had no intentions of incorporating the people of the Soviet Union into his empire. All he wants to do is use them as slave labor and harvest the oil, metal, and timber from their land. Stefan feels sick to his stomach as he passes ghost town after ghost town. Buildings are in ruin from the war. People are living in houses missing entire walls. After days of traveling, the train jerks to a stop and Stefan gets off. The air is cold but the smell of smoke fills his nose. He looks down the road and sees the fencing of a work camp where thousands of people are being held. He follows the procession of new laborers that were on board the train with him, but at the last minute ducks into a thick patch of bushes that sits on the edge of the tree line. He waits for the Nazi guards who are escorting the group to enter the camp before he starts making his way toward the fencing. Stefan peers into the camp. SS and newly conscripted Russian soldiers who are sympathetic to the Nazi cause shout out orders at the workers. Many are malnourished or are nothing but skin and bone. Anyone who's seen by the Nazis as having an inferior bloodline or belonging to an ethnic minority is used for slave labor. Unfortunately, this constitutes anyone from Russia. Stefan makes eye contact with one of the men walking toward the barracks. The man's face is covered in dirt. He can barely stand up straight from exhaustion. Stefan recognizes this man. He was a soldier in the resistance. They had conducted a few missions together. The former ally looks around to see if anyone's watching and then makes his way to the fence. Stefan, what are you doing here? He whispers. I'm looking for Tony and my daughter. An informant told me they've been taken to this camp. The man's expression becomes even more somber. He shakes his head back and forth. I'm so very sorry, Stefan, he says. Your wife and daughter were loaded into a transport a week ago. The Nazis are diverting people to the coast of France as they plan for the attack on the United States. Stefan's heart breaks. He's silent for a moment. How were they? Had they been hurt by these Nazi bastards? No, the man on the other side of the fence responds. They were weak, like all of us, but they were in relatively good health when they left. I'm sorry, Stefan. I wish I had better. Suddenly, a gunshot rings out. The former resistance fighter's eyes open wide. Stefan reaches out through the fence to steady him. Blood trickles from the man's mouth as he falls to the ground. Stefan looks up. Several Nazi guards are running toward him with their guns raised. Stefan turns and sprints to the forest. He weaves through the trees, trying to put as much distance between him and the Nazi camp as possible. He hears the sounds of dogs barking and men shouting from behind him. Stefan pushes his body as far as it'll go. He knows that if he's captured, his hopes of seeing his wife and child again would be crushed. Stefan spots a tree with thick branches and abundant foliage. 
He darts toward it and leaps off the ground, grabbing onto one of the branches. He begins to climb higher and higher into the tree. If he can hide there until the Nazis pass, he may be able to get out of this alive. Moments later, several dogs appear. They bark and growl as they run past the tree Stefan is hiding in. He lets out a sigh of relief, but it's premature. The dogs realize they've lost his scent and backtrack toward the tree he's hiding in. They begin sniffing all around the tree. The Nazi soldiers catch up and begin looking for Stefan. He closes his eyes and prays he's not discovered. Yelling can be heard from another part of the forest. The Nazis turn their heads to listen. They give new commands to the dogs, who stop sniffing around the tree and sprint toward the sound of the shouting. The Nazi soldiers follow. Stefan stays in the tree for what feels like hours. When he finally climbs down, the sun is set and the frigid night air is quiet. He makes his way back toward the train tracks, where he waits for a transport to pass by. The sound of a locomotive can be heard off in the distance. Then a behemoth of a train comes into view. Stefan runs out of the forest as fast as he can. He times his jump perfectly and grabs onto one of the handles of the train. It takes every ounce of strength, but Stefan manages to slide the car door open and falls into the train car. It's carrying supplies toward Western Europe, where they'll be used to launch an attack across the Atlantic. The clicking and clacking of the train on the tracks is like a lullaby. Stefan doesn't know exactly where this train is headed, but he knows it's at least bringing him closer to finding his wife and child. Stefan blacks out from exhaustion. When he awakes, the train is still crossing the former Soviet Union. By the angle of the sun, it seems as if it's traveling due west, but slightly to the south. This isn't ideal, but he is relatively safe on board the train, and he knows it'll eventually make its way to the west coast to deliver the supplies. Several more days go by. Stefan survives off the stores of grain that have been packed aboard the train. Whenever it rains, he catches the precious liquid in a Nazi helmet he found in one of the crates. As the sun rises a week after he snuck aboard the train, an ominous sight comes into view. In the distance, Stefan can see gigantic snow-covered peaks jutting up from the landscape. He knows these must be the Alps. He's now in a newly formed Roman Empire. As the train travels through the countryside, Stefan sees a mix of Nazi and Italian soldiers at different checkpoints. When Hitler conquered Northern Europe and the Western Soviet Union, he allowed Mussolini to control the lands that were once under the control of the Roman Empire. However, it's clear that Mussolini is not really in control. In fact, he isn't even allowed to make his own decisions. He almost cost the Nazis the war in Southern Europe, and now Hitler uses him as a figurehead while he controls the nation. There's been recent contention between the Italian puppet government and Hitler, as the Italians try to hold on to their Roman Catholic religion. Hitler, on the other hand, wants to dismantle Christianity and organized religion completely. His tension has caused the Nazis to deploy forces around the new Roman Empire to make the transition to a state ideology go more smoothly. Hitler is adamant that the only allegiance and belief system anyone in his empire should have is to him and the Nazi party. The train Stefan is hiding on reaches the coast of what was once southern France. He looks across the Mediterranean. On the other side of these waters is northern Africa, which is also under the control of the Nazis. Once the Allied forces in Europe were defeated, the Nazi army faced little to no resistance while invading other parts of the world. Hitler had no interest in building up infrastructure in North Africa, but he's incredibly interested in its resources, especially oil. Stefan closes his eyes and thinks about his wife and daughter. His train has now begun to travel northwest. Soon it'll reach the western coast of Hitler's empire. After the Nazis defeated Britain and the Soviet Union, Hitler turned his attention towards Spain. He appreciated what Francisco Franco was doing in the country, but there could only be one dictator in Europe and it was going to be him. Hitler ordered his Luftwaffe to carry out bombing runs on key targets in Spain and Portugal, followed by a series of infantry invasions. Both countries quickly fell, and Franco's pleas to remain the leader of Spain fell on deaf ears. As a sign of respect for his fellow dictator, Hitler did not execute Franco but exiled him to South America instead. The Nazis immediately began constructing railways through the country all the way to the Strait of Gibraltar, where a massive fortress was created to guard the entrance to the Mediterranean. New docks were also created to allow for easy transportation of goods and natural resources from Africa onto mainland Europe. Stefan feels the train begin to slow and prepares to jump off before it reaches the station. This is no ordinary Nazi outpost. The final destination of this train is Brest and what used to be France. It's from this region that Hitler will launch his aerial assault of the eastern United States. The Brittany Peninsula has been converted into one big airfield full of America bombers and other long-range aircraft. Stefan tucks and rolls off the train right before it crosses into a heavily guarded train yard where the supplies aboard will be offloaded. 
The French countryside has been completely demolished, and in its place are factories and airfields as far as anyone can see. Trains and transports run constantly from Germany to the western coast of Europe, as the only real threat to Hitler's domination of the world is the US. Many French people have been enlisted to aid in the war effort. Their armies fell quickly after the initial invasion of the country by the Nazi panzer and infantry divisions. Stefan breaks into a nearby house to steal clothing and food before setting out to locate his wife and daughter in the various work camps in the area. He's surprised to find a Nazi SS uniform in one of the drawers, and even though the outfit goes against everything he stands for, he puts it on, as brown cloth with the swastika stitched on the arm will allow him to move freely to search for his family. A belt with a holster hangs on the back of one of the doors. In the holster is a Luger with a full clip. Stefan knows if he has to use the pistol, it'll likely be the last thing he ever does, but having a weapon might come in handy if he runs into serious trouble. The new reality of Hitler's Europe is that no matter where anyone goes, there are always concentration camps set up to provide a free source of labor. The main group of people in the camps are Eastern Europeans and prisoners of war. Hitler's empire will always need workers, so the mass extermination of people has slowed slightly. Hitler knows that with an almost unlimited amount of free manpower and resources pouring in from all of his newly acquired territories, he can make any of his sick dreams a reality. Stefan makes his way from camp to camp, careful to interact with as few Nazis as possible. Each time he enters a new area, he tries to remain calm and conduct a thorough search for his family. After days of searching, Stefan feels defeated. He knows he can't give up, but the pain and suffering he's witnessed is enough to drive him mad. The individuals in each work camp are treated more like animals than people. They're starving and overworked. He'll not give up, but with every camp he enters, he loses a little bit of himself. Stefan is about to call it a day when he sees a young girl with her back to him. She's holding on the fence, looking out across a field. Stefan slowly approaches her. Anna? He whispers. The girl turns around, tears streaming down her face. It is his daughter. Stefan resists the urge to wrap his arms around her so he doesn't look suspicious. Papa? The girl asks. Stefan's eyes begin to water. It's me. I'm going to get you out of here, but we have to pretend we don't know each other. His daughter stares at him. She can't believe her father is really there. She squints as she looks at his Nazi uniform. Stefan understands. It's only a disguise, my love, so that I can find you and your mother. He pauses for a moment to look around. Anna, where is your mother? His daughter begins to sob. They took her, she manages to blurt out. Mama refused to do any more work for the Nazis. She spat in one of their faces and was taken away. I think they're going to kill her. Stefan's eyes open wide. Where did they take her? He asked. His daughter points to the other side of the fence where she's been staring previously. Stefan can just barely make out a group of figures standing in a straight line. Clustered in front of them are several Nazis. They hold their weapons by their side, but it is clear what's about to happen. Come with me, Stefan tells his daughter. They walk quickly toward a jeep parked outside one of the mess halls. Stefan holds his breath as he looks at the steering wheel. The keys are in the ignition. Get in the back and cover yourself with a blanket on the seat, he says to Anna. She does as she's told. Once his daughter is safely hidden, Stefan slides into the driver's seat of the jeep and turns the key. The engine roars to life. From inside the mess hall, Stefan can hear plates clatter and voices yelling. The sound of the engine alerts the Nazis that something is wrong. He must get to his wife before she's executed or he and his daughter are captured. Stefan floors the jeep and speeds toward the gate. The crack of gunshots ring out behind him as the Nazis flood out of the mess hall and open fire. The guards at the gate raise their machine guns and shoot at the incoming vehicle. Stefan unholsters the Luger he stole and returns fire. He holds his breath to steady his aim and focuses. His resistance training immediately kicks in. He buries around in the chest of one of the guards and sends the second diving for cover. Stefan pushes the accelerator down so hard he feels as if his foot might go through the floor of the jeep. The vehicle slams through the gate and veers down the dirt road. Stefan turns the wheel hard and steers toward the row of prisoners who are about to be executed in the field. The Nazi guards watch the incoming jeep, unsure of what's going on. Then they see their comrades in pursuit from the work camp. Before they can raise their guns to the jeep, it's upon him. Stefan hits several of the Nazi soldiers as he skids to a stop, sending the men flying through the air. There are now only two soldiers remaining. They unleash a barrage of bullets into the side of the jeep. Stefan rolls out onto the ground. He pops up from behind the door and returns fire. He hits one of the Nazis in the stomach. The man falls to the ground. Stefan turns the pistol on the second Nazi and pulls the trigger, but instead of firing, there's only a click. The gun is jammed. Stefan ducks back behind the jeep just as the Nazis open fire again. The bullets ricochet off the metal frame of the vehicle. Stefan crawls to the side of the jeep. He waits for the Nazi to run out of bullets. When the firing ceases, Stefan hears the soldier begin to reload. He sprints out from behind the vehicle and runs straight to the enemy. He tackles the man to the ground, punching him as hard as he can in the face. His fist connects with the Nazi's nose, shattering it and knocking the soldier out. 
Stefan pants as he regains control of his body and slows his heartbeat. Then he hears a familiar voice. Stefan, is that you? He looks up to see his wife. She has a shocked look on her face, but when their eyes meet, she smiles and places a hand gently on his cheek. I knew you'd come, she says. Stefan stands and embraces her for a moment. The shouts of the Nazi soldiers running toward them breaks the joyful moment and brings them back to reality. Come on, Stefan says, signaling to the jeep. Stefan, his wife, and the other prisoners who were to be executed pile into the vehicle. Anna hugs her mother. The jeep drives away, leaving the Nazis in the dust. Stefan and the escapees have a long way to go to get out of Nazi control to Europe, but he's now reunited with his family, and he'll do anything to make sure they get to safety. It's September 18, 1931. Adolf Hitler has not quite turned into the beast he'll become known as, but the man sure does have a temper. He's at his Munich apartment, screaming and shouting, spit flying out of his mouth. The object of his fury is his half-niece, Gailey Raubel. Some people say this girl would be the only love of his life, but on this day, the two are engaged in a tempestuous clash. Is it because he is the father she never really had, or he just loves her dearly so he doesn't want her to leave? Or is she pregnant with his child, an embarrassment to Adolf and the Nazi party? Is he just out of his mind on a cocktail of hard drugs, or is she the one who's deranged? This is still a mystery, but what isn't a mystery is that soon after this argument occurred, Gailey was found with a bullet in her dead body, with her uncle Adolf's smoking gun at her side. That's right, and many people thought that Hitler had fired that gun. The story became one of the biggest scandals in Germany during the period. There's just so much people don't know about Mr. Adolf Hitler. That's why today we're going to take a look at his life and try to figure out why he was the way he was. This show is not so much about Hitler as we know him, the man who waged war on the world, but the man himself. That's why we'll call him Adolf today. We'll come back to the question of if he murdered his niece a bit later, but first let's have a look at that little bundle of joy that was Adolf as a kid. He was born on April 20th, 1889, which made him a Taurus. Okay, so we know most of you don't believe in that kind of thing, but there's no doubt that Adolf was the proverbial bull in a china shop. He smashed up half of Europe. He was born in what is present-day Austria to his father Aloy and his mother Clara. You'll hear many unusual things today, including that Clara was Aloy's third wife and that also his second cousin. She became part of his household at the age of 16, but first as a maid. At that time, Aloy was still married to his second wife. Clara left the household but came back when Aloy's second wife died. She helped Aloy bring up the children and then got pregnant with him. As this was sketchy business back then, they had to go to the church and ask for permission to marry. What's also strange is that she still called him uncle when she was intimate with him. As you'll see later in the show in relation to Adolf, we can invoke the expression the apple didn't fall far from the tree. The two were married in January 1885. Adolf was their fourth child. Clara absolutely loved him. He was a mama's boy, no doubt, which shaped the man he would become. There's also been some speculation that Adolf was beaten by his father and shielded by his mother. But historians aren't too sure of just how physical Aloy got with Adolf. Still, it's said that Aloy was domineering, aggressive, and sometimes cruel. The family at least wasn't too badly off since Aloy earned decent money as a customs official. One of the reasons that Clara liked Adolf so much was the fact that she already had lost two of her kids, Gustav and Ida, to diphtheria. Out of six children she had with Aloy, only two survived childhood, Adolf and Paula. Not surprisingly, Paula changed her name after the Second World War. It is safe to say that Adolf feared his father and adored his mother. When his father died in 1903, Adolf was 13, and he didn't seem overly troubled. Now he had his mother all to himself. Yes, this is all very Freudian. Just wait until you hear about his sex life when he becomes an adult. Freud would have had a field day. Adolf was always a sickly child, so soon after his father's death, Clara pulled him out of school and told him he could concentrate on his newfound love, art. He loved sketching, playing piano, and was keen on other creative pursuits. This is why she was supportive when he told her he wanted to go to Vienna and try to become a paid artist. Off he went, and oh boy, did he struggle to make it. At times, he barely had enough money to feed himself. Vienna was a nightmare. In 1906, Clara discovered a lump in her breast, and so she went to the family doctor. It wasn't good news. She had breast cancer. But it seemed the doctor didn't tell her at first. It was Adolf that eventually told her what was wrong. This devastated him. Clara underwent a mastectomy soon after, but the cancer metastasized. The Hitlers were informed that Clara was not long for this world. Adolf returned from Vienna and became her caretaker. He watched her suffer in pain as she was treated with an experimental type of chemotherapy. This was almost impossible for him to watch. Her throat became seriously swollen, making it difficult for her to eat or speak. 
This period in Adolf's life would seep into the very marrow of his bones. Clara died on December 21, 1907. Adolf was more than sad. He was stricken with grief to the point of delirium. The family doctor said some years later, in all my career I have never seen anyone so prostrate with grief as Adolf Hitler. This doctor was actually Jewish, so when Adolf was killing Jewish people in the millions, he allowed the doctor to emigrate from Austria to the USA. This was his way of saying thanks for trying. We should say it's not certain if it was Adolf that helped the doctor get away, but that is the theory. During the war, when the doctor was in the US, he was contacted by the Office of Strategic Services, an intelligence agency that was the precursor to the CIA. They wanted to know what Adolf Hitler was like as a child. What made the monster? The doctor said, While Hitler was not a mother's boy in the usual sense, I never witnessed a closer attachment. Their love had been mutual. Clara Hitler adored her son. She allowed him his own way whenever possible. For example, she admired his watercolor paintings and drawings and supported his artistic ambitions in opposition to his father at what cost to herself, one may guess. Even though Adolf had been loved by his mother, you can't argue with the fact that he had a pretty grim childhood. He grew up with a tyrannical father in a family that had suffered the loss of four children. And just when Adolf was trying to enjoy his adulthood, he had no parents at all. As he grew older, he always carried a picture of his mother around in his pocket. In his house, he had pictures of her on the wall. When he became the leader of the Nazi party and the Führer of Germany, he designated her birthday of August 12 as a day of honor for the German mother. We can look to his sister Paula to know more about Adolf. She wrote a diary when she was a child, and it's quite interesting. In it, she talked about how her brother bullied her throughout her youth. In one entry she wrote, Once again I felt my brother's hand land on my face. It seems she never joined the Nazi party or outwardly showed any support for her older brother's ambitions, although in 2005 a historian discovered that at one point during the war Paula was in a relationship with a Third Reich officer named Erwin Jekelius. The psychiatrist and neurologist was involved with the terrible Nazi euthanasia programs. He ended up a prisoner of the Soviet Union and later died from bladder cancer in a Soviet labor camp in 1952. Paula wanted to marry him, but Adolf wouldn't give his permission. You'd think she would have hated Adolf for that, but it seems despite the bullying, she actually admired him. When the US Army interviewed her in 1945, she outright didn't believe that her brother would order the killing of millions of Jews. We can glean more about Adolf's life from the transcript of the interview. Paula said, My father, who was of great harshness in the education of his children, and who only spoiled me as the family's pet, was the absolute type of old Austrian official, conservative, and loyal to his emperor to the skin. My mother, however, was a very soft and tender person. When her mother was sick with cancer, she said Adolf did nothing but care for her and her mother. She said, assisting me, my brother Adolf spoiled my mother during this time of her life with overflowing tenderness. He was indefatigable with his care for her, wanting to comply with any desire she could possibly have, and all to demonstrate his great love for her. She said, Adolf showed little interest in most of his subjects in school and only ever seemed interested in artistic endeavors. She told the interviewer, at school he was nothing less than a showboy. He often came home with bad school reports and admonitions. One thing she was adamant about was that her dear brother could not have done all the wicked things he'd been accused of. I do not believe that my brother ordered the crime committed to innumerable human beings in the concentration camps, or that he even knew of these crimes, she said. Although she did add, it may be possible, however, that the hard years during his youth in Vienna caused his anti-Jewish attitude. He was starving severely in Vienna and he believed that his failure in painting was only due to the fact that trade in works of art was in Jewish hands. This is important. Adolf, while not a terrible artist, was a failure. His dreams dissolved before his eyes, his stomach ached while others prospered, and he was sure he was just as good as them. As an artist, he was very average, with one critic rightly saying many years later, if you walk down the Seine and see 100 artists, 80 will be better than this. Adolf may have only been harsh with his sister because in some ways he thought it was his responsibility to act that way. He always made sure she had money at least. Maybe Adolf wasn't always a monster, but monstrous ideas formed somewhere in that warped head of his. What we consider evil doesn't always look monstrous. Evil often wears a suit and tie and has impeccable manners. This is why the political theorist Hannah Arndt talked about the banality of evil. You can be a loving husband and father and still go to work where you usher hordes of innocent people into a gas chamber, lest we forget normal people can do terrible things. We must never forget that about Adolf Hitler. He wasn't always a fiend. We can see this in his love for animals, especially where his beloved dog was concerned. 
If you're wondering how Adolf could be so fond of animals and yet send humans toward torture and death, you can turn to a book that states, For leading Nazis, animal protection and crimes against humanity were not a contradiction in terms. On the contrary, they even felt that they were part of a moral elite. It's a difficult proposition to ask people to accept that a man whose ideology classed certain people as subhuman could have a nice side. He caused pain and anguish on a level that put Nero and Genghis Khan to shame. But he wasn't always monstrous, his ideology was. An American journalist once asked how people can order bombs to be dropped on totally innocent civilians in modern conflicts and then go to church and have family barbecues with the kids around. The simple fact is that they really think they are morally on the right side of history. Isn't that always the case when humans are destroyed in mass? Destroyers of worlds take the moral high ground. They say they're doing the killing for the greater good when so often it simply boils down to power and economic interests. But with Adolf, as you'll see, there were also mental issues, severe mental issues, at a time when many Germans were looking for a leader to bail them out from years of poverty and hardships. But let's not get ahead of ourselves here, we still have the younger Adolf to think about, the man that came before those death camps and blitzkriegs. Adolf Hitler fought in the First World War, and for his bravery he received the Iron Cross. He seemed to have some romantic notion about war, despite just how bloody awful that war was. He once said war was the greatest of all experiences. But man, was he bitter when Germany lost. Adolf, like many others in Germany, blamed the capitulation on Jews and Marxists. He was sure that what he considered real Germans wouldn't have given up so easily, although they hardly gave up easily. His thinking became quite clear in 1919. He wrote what is now referred to as the Gromlich Letter. This is an important piece of history for anyone who studies the Holocaust since it's the first time we see Adolf Hitler's anti-Semitism on record. He wrote in the letter that the government's aim must unshakably be the removal of the Jews altogether. We won't talk too much about this rise to power since this show is more about Adolf Hitler, the man, but we will say that he got involved with politics and never turned back. He wrote about that later saying, I finally came to the conviction that I had to take this step. It was the most decisive resolve of my life. From here, there was and could be no turning back. Soon he was filling beer houses and heads with the hatred he preached, and people roared with delight when he spoke. He chose populist themes. He chose the use of scapegoats. Everyone's misery was the fault of these people or those people. One person who watched those early speeches later said, We erupted into a frenzy of nationalistic pride that bordered on hysteria. For minutes on end we shouted at the top of our lungs, with tears streaming down our faces, Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil. From that moment on, I belong to Adolf Hitler body and soul. Sieg Heil means hail to victory if you didn't know. Adolf's extreme views of a superior Aryan race became the fundamental foundation of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, aka the Nazi Party. He was the one who actually designed the flag of the party, the swastika, an ancient Sanskrit symbol that means something like well-being and prosperity. Hitler rotated the symbol and made some changes to creating a hooked cross or Hakenkreuz, now a symbol that reminds us of hate and genocide. He once said why he chose the ancient Sanskrit symbol, writing, In red we see the social ideal of the movement, in white the nationalistic idea, in the swastika the mission of the struggle for the victory of the Aryan man, and by the same token the victory of the idea of creative work, which as such always has been and always will be anti-Semitic. Again, we have to skip a bit of history. The Nazis attempted a coup and failed, which is why Adolf ended up in prison. This is when he dictated his book Mein Kampf or My Struggle in English. This contained much of his hateful ideology. He compares certain kinds of people to germs and parasites. It's totalitarianism 101, always dehumanize your enemy, that way they'll be easier to kill. He got out of prison and later he took full advantage of the Great Depression. Many Germans were near starving. People were so desperate for food they were eating horses that died in the streets. Well, they did that at least on one occasion. Folks were fed up, and when the public is down you can be sure the populists get rolling. Extremism is always at its most influential when the populace is desperate. Adolf's rise to power was almost certain. In spite of how many enemies he had in Germany, he would soon put an end to many of them. As the Social Democrats and the Communists were arguing with each other, Adolf Hitler was attracting larger and larger crowds when he spoke at events. This ascension was watched by Adolf's nephew. This guy can give us some more insights into Adolf the man. Not many people know that Adolf had a nephew born in the UK. He was the son of Adolf's half-brother Aloy Hitler Jr. and was named William Hitler. Ironically, William grew up in Liverpool on 102 Upper Stanhope Street. 
a house that was destroyed in the Liverpool Blitz during the war. As William grew into adulthood, he saw his uncle Adolf rise to power in Germany. He went to Germany to visit a few times and ended up living there. On the back of Adolf becoming Chancellor when William was just 22, he landed a few jobs, one at an automotive factory. We tend not to think about Adolf in terms of a man who had squabbles with his family. But as we said, monsters are always all too human, as Hitler's favorite philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche might have said. According to William, his uncle was often a right royal pain in the backside, once saying, I cannot even go on an outing without risking a summons to Hitler. Adolf, as you probably already figured out, was very controlling. This might be the understatement of the century, given he wanted to control half the world. But he was like that with his own family. He was petty, too, according to William who, it must be said, never really bought into all that Nazi ideology his uncle was screaming about to desperate German citizens. Adolf didn't like that his nephew was going back and forth between England and Germany, and no doubt spilling all the family secrets. Like any dictator-to-be, Adolf was trying to build a kind of mythology around himself. He was trying to tell people he was leading the Aryan race to better pastures, and he didn't want anyone to know his weaknesses. So Adolf got very upset when William started talking about his uncle's dandruff problem and his proclivity to lose his temper over trifling matters. Then, in 1939, he wrote an article for Look magazine entitled, Why I Hate My Uncle. Talk about demythologizing the Fuhrer. The article dispelled any notion of the Fuhrer's almost godlike status. William wrote, We had cakes and whipped cream, Hitler's favorite dessert. I was struck by his intensity, his feminine gestures. There was dandruff on his coat. Perhaps the whole purpose of this article was just making a quick buck. But for a while, he'd been blackmailing his uncle, telling him, get me a better job or I'll go to the press and I'll let all the cats out of the bags. It must have taken some balls, considering that he was blackmailing a man who ordered the deaths of millions of people. William didn't risk going back to Germany after that. And he'd even go on to fight against the Nazis for the Americans. No wonder Adolf referred to him as his loathsome nephew. William talked about his final meeting with Adolf, which again gives us some insight into Adolf the family man. He wrote, I shall never forget the last time he sent for me. He was in a brutal temper when I arrived. Walking back and forth, brandishing his horsehide whip, he shouted insults at my head as if he were delivering a political oration. His vengeful brutality on that day made me fear for my physical safety. The reason why Adolf was so furious is that William had opened his mouth again. He published some stories when he was in England and again talked about his uncle. He said in the Look magazine article, I drove there with friends and was shown into the garden. Hitler was entertaining some very beautiful women at tea. When he saw us, he strode up, slashing a whip as he walked and taking the tops off of the flowers. He took that occasion to warn me to never again mention that I was his nephew. William said Adolf had a tendency to become obsessed with women, after which he would become controlling. He'd intimidate people if he didn't get his own way, but he was also prone to bouts of deep depression. William said something important relating to a mystery that still confounds people today. The answer to this mystery might explain a lot about Adolf Hitler. William said he went back to Berlin in 1931 and something big had happened involving his uncle. William wrote, the family was in trouble. He said Gailey Raubel, Hitler's half-niece, was dead. William explained, everyone knew that Hitler and she had long been intimate and that she had been expecting a child, a fact that enraged Hitler. His revolver was found by her body. As the story goes, and as Hitler told the police, he'd been with his niece at the apartment and then gone to a meeting. When he came back, she was dead with a bullet inside her from his gun. As you know, Adolf wasn't Gailey's real father, but after her biological father died, her mother went to work as a housekeeper for Adolf. Gailey was 17 years old at the time, 19 years younger than Adolf. The question is, was Adolf overstepping his boundaries? Was he in fact having a relationship with her? It's well documented that he was very controlling of her to the extent that some people said he kept her indoors and didn't allow her to date anyone. But that didn't stop her as she ended up dating Adolf's trusted chauffeur, Emile Maurice. When Adolf found out, he put an end to the relationship. He fired Maurice but allowed him to stay in the SS. After this, he barely let Gailey out of his sight. Some people say, despite this, she was the only truly deep love affair of his life. This sounds more believable when you hear what Adolf's right-hand man, Hermann Göring, said at the Nuremberg trials. Gailey's death had such a devastating effect on Hitler that it changed his relationship to all other people. Not many people knew Adolf Hitler like Göring did. We can trust his remark for its truthfulness. Adolf was certainly obsessed with Gailey, just as he'd been obsessed with his mother. But is this why he killed her? If he killed her? Many people thought Hitler was the killer. After all, she was found with his 6.35mm Walther pistol at her side. They said he'd done it and then laid the pistol next to her. In 1931, Adolf might have been powerful, 
but he still had a lot of enemies in Germany who were willing to accuse him of murder. Gailey was given what one person called a perfunctory post-mortem, and she was then quickly buried. The Nazi party propagandists got busy creating tales about her depression, but some who knew her said they didn't believe the stories. This became a huge scandal. Adolf, not surprisingly, was upset about what some of the newspapers were saying about him. He called the stories a terrible smear campaign. He then wrote a story in the Munchner Post, an attempt to put the flames of the scandal out. The newspaper said they'd had a big fight because Gailey wanted to go to Vienna to get engaged to a man, and Adolf had forbidden her to go. In response to that, Adolf wrote, It is not true that she was going to get engaged in Vienna or that I was against an engagement. It is true that my niece was tormented with the worry that she was not yet fit for her public appearance. She wanted to go to Vienna to have her voice checked once again by a voice teacher. He also wrote, It is not true that I left my apartment on September 18th after a fierce row. There was no row, no excitement, when I left my apartment on that day. The Nazis then threatened anyone who was thinking about writing more on the story with lawsuits. But one journalist, Fritz Gerlich, didn't back down. He was sure that Adolf had killed Gailey. In March 1933, he was about to publish the evidence he'd collected. Then one night, that spring, Nazi stormtroopers burst into his office, beat him up, and took all the evidence. He was taken to prison and years later executed at Dachau concentration camp. He and others believed that Gailey's nose had been broken before she died. It's also said that she was pregnant either with Adolf's child or someone else's. Either way, this could have led to her death. There has been much speculation about Adolf's sex life. Some people have said that he didn't really have one, that he was asexual. Then there are documents that have been published in various newspaper articles and in one book called The Hidden Hitler that suggested that Adolf was a closeted homosexual, which might explain Nazi homophobia. There is some pretty strong evidence that states he had relationships with men when he was fighting in World War I. There's also some convincing evidence that he killed those who uncovered his secret due to fears of blackmailing. A lawyer who actually got to see Adolf's military files, Eric Ebermeyer, told The Guardian despite his bravery toward the enemy, because of his homosexual activity he lost out on a promotion to non-commissioned officer. Another writer said he allowed the persecution of gays in order to disguise his own true colors. But this doesn't really gel with him having a relationship with his half-niece. Maybe he didn't, but he was definitely possessive of her. One man, Otto Strasser, said he was probably the only guy that Adolf allowed to take Gailey to a dance. He said, I could feel how much she suffered because of Hitler's jealousy. She was a fun-loving young thing who enjoyed the Mardi Gras excitement in Munich, but was never able to persuade Hitler to accompany her to any of the many wild balls. Finally, during the 1931 Mardi Gras, Hitler allowed me to take Gailey to a ball. He said after the ball, they both sat down in a quiet place in an English garden where there was a Chinese tower. She wept uncontrollably, telling him that her uncle Adolf was madly in love with her, but his jealousy drove her around the bend. She wanted to escape. She told Strasser that Adolf asked her to do things that repulsed her, and when Strasser inquired what those things were, all she said was they were the kinds of things you can find in a book called Psychopathia Sexualis. Some of the things she said are too X-rated for YouTube. After she died, he kept a portrait of Gailey next to a portrait of his mother in every one of his rooms, according to the researcher Robert Waite. The thing is, there have been many people like Strasser who've told stories about Adolf Hitler's strange life, and many of the stories just don't match up. But if there is a recurring theme, it's that he was possessive, sometimes paranoid, short-tempered, obsessed with women, starting with his mom and was at least a tad strange regarding his close relations. Can it be coincidence then that few of the women that knew Adolf Hitler in perhaps an intimate way suffered from bouts of depression and obviously didn't want to live anymore? One such woman was actress Renata Muller, who may have been on intimate terms with Adolf. We say may because again, this is speculation. In 1937, her body was found broken on the street many stories below the room where she'd been staying. Her death certificate said the reason for death was epilepsy, but several people later said they saw Gestapo officers enter her apartment building that night. Had she been in a relationship with Adolf? Some people think she had. Her film director, A. Zeisler, later confirmed this rumor in communications with the American intelligence and that she was becoming severely distressed over what kinds of things he was asking her to do. Zeisler said that Adolf once fell on the floor and begged her to kick him, condemned himself as unworthy and just groveled in an agonizing manner. The scene became intolerable to her and she finally acceded to his wishes. As she continued to kick him, he became more and more excited. But can we trust these stories? After all, propaganda works both ways. And there are enough people in the world that wanted and still want to make Adolf Hitler look like a sex-crazed beast. 
On the other hand, there is a lot more evidence regarding Adolf's addiction to various drugs, including powerful opiates and methamphetamines. He didn't drink booze, he didn't eat badly, but he did like his drugs. This is not speculation. We can see what drugs he took from the notes of journals and his doctor, Theodore Morel. If Adolf did have some strange sexual desires at times, these might have been episodes while he was out of his mind on the Nazi version of crystal meth. Maybe he came down from the meth high with the Nazi version of the opioid oxycodone called Eucodal. Adolf was very likely addicted to Eucodal, at least he took it a lot. Addicts of strong opiates and methamphetamines have their thinking and rationing skills profoundly changed due to the composition of the drugs. Add to this that he was said to have taken a lot of barbiturates, meds that are really ruthless Xanax pills, and, well, all we'll say is getting off those things would have driven Adolf half mad. It's said he also dabbled with cocaine, so we think he took a bunch of chill pills for the come down. In this regard, it's really not surprising that Adolf Hitler was a bit off his rocker. This is all detailed in the book Blitzed, Drugs in the Third Reich. With all this in mind, there is no doubt that Adolf Hitler was incredibly unhinged. You knew that, from all the things he did in his political life. But we hope today you've learned some things you didn't know about his personal life. For sure, some of the rumors might not be true, but there is just too much evidence against him to suggest he lived anything close to a normal life when he was behind four walls. In fact, psychiatrists have tried to diagnose him over the years, and the list of conditions is as long as one of the dead Fuhrer's arms. The conditions include hysteria, histronic personality disorder, schizophrenia, paranoia, sadistic personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, psychopathy, antisocial personality disorder, bipolar disorder, Asperger's syndrome, and schizotypal personality disorder. We'll end this show right here and let you diagnose Mr. Adolf Hitler. The date is Thursday, October 29th, 1914. The Great War, the war to end all wars, rages across Europe and has become a quagmire of trenches dug along hundreds of miles of Central Europe. Artillery barrages sweep from side to side, attempting to drive out the men in those trenches, and victories are measured in inches taken by one side or the other. Always though, the men return back to their holes, huddling in cold, wet mud as enemy artillery takes revenge for the latest assault. Tens of thousands have already died, and today, fresh recruits move to reinforce the German lines. The men are recently drafted from across Germany's poorer areas and together make up the 3,000-strong 16th Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiment. A messenger arrives on horseback bearing critical news. The British have managed to break through German lines, and if they are not stopped, a large part of the front could collapse. The regiment's commanding officer makes a quick decision and barks out orders to his subcommanders, who blow on whistles to order the men up onto their feet and marching forward at double time. The soldiers hurry the best they can through a forest shattered by artillery barrages and thick with mud, marching to close the gap exploited by the British before a total collapse of this part of the front risks the collapse of Germany's front lines. Through the smoke and fog, though the men of the regiments flanking the Bavarian regiments march catch only glimpses of grey-green caps, which look from a distance and through a haze a lot like British uniforms. Alarmed, they begin to open fire, unknowingly decimating entire swaths of their own troops. By the time the terrible mistake is realized, the thousands of soldiers are reduced to a few hundred survivors, and in one company, there's only a single man left standing, a 26-year-old soldier by the name of Adolf Hitler. History has well documented the tragedy of Hitler's survival that fateful day, a deed which he repeated numerous times throughout the war, cheating death by incredible margins. Once he was ordered out of a tent where military awards were being presented, only for an artillery shell to strike the tent and reduce it to a crater, with Hitler just outside it. Another time, a gas attack strikes amongst his line, yet Hitler manages to avoid the worst effects of the gas and is only temporarily blinded. While other survivors of the gas succumb by the thousands to disease and injury, Hitler makes a complete recovery and is once more back on the front lines, where another exploding artillery shell buries shrapnel in his leg but leaves his body whole and otherwise unharmed. For all intents and purposes, Hitler was invincible, uncannily dodging the wrath of a grim reaper who every day claimed thousands. As we look at the world that arose from the ashes of World War II, we are prone to asking how much of the peace of the last 80 years would have existed if Hitler had never driven the world into its last major confrontation. 
War has not been abolished. Five minutes on any news program will quickly remind you of that fact. Yet the truth is that war between major powers has not occurred since the end of World War II, and after centuries, millennia even, of incessant conflict between major states and empires, it's hard to believe that without World War II's terrible consequences and the ensuing political order, humanity would have simply given up on its lifelong hobby of killing each other as frequently as possible. The fruits that were fertilized in the ashes of World War II have shaped a new world that would be completely alien to any human being born before the 20th century, a world where major powers pursue diplomacy over war and imperial ambitions are kept in check by a strong alliance of liberal democracies. World War II gave us the United Nations, an agency that rose from the rubble of the League of Nations, and gave it a grim determination to avoid conflict thanks to the League's many failures. Without World War II, the world's first attempt to unify its governments would have failed, and the old order of shifting alliances and constant conflict would have returned. The war also gave us two rival superpowers who held the planet at risk of total annihilation for decades. Yet it's important to note that it was the two specific superpowers who rose to prominence, the United States and the Soviet Union. Two opposing ideologies, democracy versus communism, in a world where violence between communists, federalists, imperialists, and democrats had raged for decades. In Germany alone, political groups split between the left and the right had been killing themselves for years after the fall of the Kaiser and his empire. And the violence repeated across the whole of Europe as communism found allies and parties of workers oppressed and exploited by runaway capitalism. It's easy for modern observers to be ignorant of the extreme violence between these two ideologies and of the consequence of the two major powers arising from World War II with the means to annihilate each other along with the world and both radically shifted on opposite ends of the political spectrum. Yet again, it was specifically the United States and the Soviet Union who arose from World War II, two powers who were almost equally matched in every regard. The United States maintained a nuclear advantage while the Soviet Union maintained a conventional power advantage. Both sides found themselves facing the threat of total defeat in any conflict, and thus an equilibrium was achieved. One which actively prevented all-out hostilities on several occasions and rescued the world from Armageddon during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Without Hitler, it's unlikely that it would have been the evenly matched Soviet Union and the United States who rose to prominence, and this imbalance would almost certainly have led to all-out conflict, either because one side believed itself capable of achieving complete victory through nuclear weapons, or because the weaker side believed it would be forever dominated if it did not strike first with nuclear weapons, while it could still potentially win the conflict. There would have existed a tipping point in history between the two rivals, where the larger power reached a point that if the smaller power did not act immediately, it would never again be able to act to overthrow it. The larger power would have also been aware of this point, would have been aware of its approach, and would have had every incentive to launch a surprise attack on the smaller power first in order to annihilate it. The world would have gone up in nuclear fire. This point existed also between the US and the Soviet Union. Sometime around the mid-1950s when the Soviet Union began the mass production of atomic weapons and testing on long-range rockets to deliver them intercontinentally. The US was itself greatly behind the Soviets in rocket technology, but had far surpassed them in long-range bombers. If the Soviet Union closed the nuclear gap by developing intercontinental ballistic missiles, it would forever eliminate the US's only nuclear advantage over the Soviet Union. Many within the American military argued for a surprise nuclear attack on the Soviet Union, believing that war was ultimately unavoidable and that this might be the only chance to win it with minimal damage to the United States. Sure, Europe would be reduced to nuclear rubble, but only a few American cities could possibly be hit by Russian long-range bombers, and even this was unlikely. The Soviet Union would be crushed under nuclear rubble, and the world would be free of the threat of a major all-out nuclear war forever, even if it cost the whole of Europe. Thankfully, the American presidents didn't listen to their military commanders, and of course we now understand the consequences of nuclear war far better than we did back then. We know, for instance, that while the United States would have been completely spared any atomic attacks, it and the rest of the world would have been starved to death in the ensuing nuclear winter as trillions of tons of debris shrouded the world for years. We know that global weathered patterns would have eventually carried massive plumes of radioactive fallout as far as the American East Coast, potentially making large swaths of the eastern seaboard uninhabitable for decades, perhaps longer. The world would die a cold, dark death and the survivors would find little land free of the poison of radiation on which to grow their crops once the sun returned a decade or more later. 
It was Hitler and his rise to power and the war and atrocities he committed that gave pause to the American presidents being compelled to strike out at the Soviet Union. But it was also the fact that their enemy was in fact the Soviet Union, a nation powerful enough to have a level of parity with the United States. Once more, had it not been these two specific nations that rose from World War II, the odds of an uneven matched set of superpowers are almost a certainty. But who could have arisen? Without Hitler, Germany's fate could have taken a threefold path. The constitutional democracy that arose after the fall of the Kaiser was unstable, and the president tried daily to maintain a balance between the opposing political parties. Democratic socialists and full-blown communists made up a large segment of the left seats in the German parliament, and hardline Nazis and imperialist nationalists made up equally large segments in the right seats in parliament. Not only were the two sides opposed to each other, the parties were all completely opposed to one another as well, leaving German democracy so unstable that two elections were called for in 1932 alone. This leaves the possibility of three paths for Germany without Hitler. Germany could have become a strong liberal democracy, which would have found itself closely allied with the democracies of Britain and France. This would have left the entirety of Western Europe in direct opposition to the expansion of communist Eastern Europe. Without a world war to weaken Germany and draw the United States into European affairs, the US would have remained as it was at the outbreak of World War II, isolationist and content to let Europe fight out its own problems. Hostilities between East and West were all but inevitable, and even during World War II the British considered for the entirety of the war launching offensives against the Soviet Union after the fall of Germany. Hitler was fully aware of these hostilities, and when he launched his famous counterattack against the Allies pressing into Germany, which resulted in iconic battles such as the Battle of the Bulge, his strategy had in fact been not to completely defeat the British and Americans, but to hand them such a defeat just large enough that they agreed to a ceasefire. After the ceasefire, he hoped to talk the two sides into joining him against the Soviet Union, and was confident enough in this plan to consider it a likely path to a German exit from World War II. With a German liberal democracy, World War II may have been postponed a few years, but would have still taken place, albeit without the United States involving itself. Given Germany's initial lead in developing the nuclear bomb, the West would have used these bombs the moment they became available, devastating the European countryside. With its vast reserves of manpower though, the Soviets could have held out long enough for their spies to steal the secrets of the bomb and respond with their own in a few years. The devastating nuclear escalation would have led to a global climate catastrophe. Germany, however, could also have become an imperialist state once again. The German president during the early 1930s, Paul von Hindenburg, actually made Hitler chancellor because he expected Hitler to crush his political rivals and place the nation back on the path to imperialism. This historical outcome would very closely match a Germany of a third option, one where Hitler died in World War I and the Nazi party gave the chancellorship to a much more competent and psychologically stable man. With Germany rising once more as an imperial power or as a fascist state with a more capable version of Hitler, it's indubitable that the nation would have launched the same offensives as it did the days before the official start of World War II. This would have prompted the same response from Britain and France and the same start to World War II. The difference this time, however, would have been a military leader who respected the opinions of his generals who would not have foolishly launched an attack against the Soviet Union until it had secured Western Europe completely, and who would have practiced war with a more careful and tactfully sound approach. A more capable German Führer or Kaiser, for example, would not have called for a halt to the German forces on their way to completely crush the British as they tried to flee at Dunkirk. A strategic mistake by Hitler, which would have irrevocably changed the course of the war for the Allies for the worse. Without Hitler and the rise of a capable Führer or Kaiser, Germany would have been an unstoppable war machine, which would have crushed the Allies before the United States could join the fight. Then Germany could have turned its full might against the Soviet Union, which facing only roughly half of Germany's power still suffered near defeat in our real World War II. Facing the full strength of the Wehrmacht alone, the Soviets would have quickly fallen and the German Empire or Third Reich would lay claim to all of Europe. Britain, France, the Soviet Union, and countless other European nations would exist only as governments in exile inside the United States. A different Cold War would have fallen on the planet, one where the United States faced off across the Atlantic against a Germany far more powerful than itself, its only choice being nuclear war now or total and complete subjugation forever. The Holy Bible states that God works all things for good, 
And given the possibilities of a Germany without Hitler, it can be hard to argue that indeed history did turn out for the best despite the horrors of World War II. Millions of lives were lost, yet in the killing, it's likely that billions of lives were saved. And instead of a war of nuclear annihilation or a continuation of the incessant warmongering between major powers, we inherited a world of relative international peace. Our conflicts between major powers limited to small proxy wars in faraway corners of the world, and largely cultural and economic in nature. We never thought we'd say this, but thank God for Hitler? All around you is a ruined city, its streets reduced to rubble by years of aerial bombardment, and now a storm of enemy artillery. Civilians huddle in basements, desperately scavenging for food where they can. Soldiers frantically dig in, improvising defensive positions in the wreckage. In the tense hours before the enemy attack begins, you and your fellow fighters are told to expect no mercy, and to give no ground, and to fight to the last man. It's your duty and honor to die for your country, and anyone who panics and tries to run away will be shot as an example to the others. You and your comrades have few weapons, little ammunition, and have had little training. When the attack finally comes, it's overwhelming, shells rain down, and the enemy infantry skilled in the tactics of urban combat slowly make their way forward, street by street, supported by thousands of tanks. The fighting is brutal and at close quarters, and casualties on both sides are appalling. Now imagine, you're only 12 years old. It's Berlin, April 1945, and the situation is desperate. The war is already as good as lost. The German army is incapable of holding its front lines against the never-ending pressure of Allied attacks. The Third Reich is crumbling fast. But Hitler orders the armed forces and the civilian population to fight on to the bitter end. In the West, American and British Commonwealth forces have liberated France and pushed through Belgium. The last great German offensive on the Western Front has ended in catastrophe in the frozen fighting of the Battle of the Bulge, losing more than 90,000 men and hundreds of tanks that cannot be replaced. Now the Allies have crossed into Germany itself, reaching the Elbe River. In the east, the unstoppable Soviet juggernaut, after pausing in its relentless advance to secure its flanks and improve its supply, has once again broken through the weakened German defensive lines. Berlin is surrounded, under constant artillery bombardment, and awaiting the final Soviet assault into the city. Hitler continues to give orders for relief forces to punch through the Soviet stranglehold on the city and relieve the capital, but those are fantasies. German forces outside the city are exhausted and far too weak, and all their efforts to break through have already failed. No help is coming. Germany's military has already lost more than 3 million dead over the course of the war, with another more than 1 million missing and taken prisoner. Her manpower reserves are completely exhausted by nearly six long years of total war waged across continents. An entire generation of German men has been devastated, and the German high command is desperate for every living soul they can throw into the front lines. They've been scraping the bottom of the barrel for some time now. In September 1944, as German forces are pushed back further and further on both fronts, Hitler orders the creation of the Volkssturm, a sort of improvised militia separate from the army. It officially drafts males as young as 16 and as old as 60, but much younger boys sometimes volunteer and are sometimes forced to serve in its ranks. Some of the older men are veterans of the First World War, called on once again to fight and die for their country in a titanic struggle, but most have no military experience at all, and are given only the most basic training and sparse and outdated equipment. Some even go into battle carrying weapons from the previous century. These old men and teenagers are hurled unprepared into combat alongside the army and take terrible casualties. By February of 1945, as the military situation continues to deteriorate hopelessly, the Volkssturm starts conscripting women and girls as auxiliary personnel, but none of these measures are nearly enough. The Nazi leadership has long been interested in preparing children for war. Nazi youth groups have been formed as early as 1922, in the social and political upheaval after the disastrous First World War, and in 1926 the Hitler Youth was officially christened. Boys as young as 10 years old were encouraged to participate in the junior branch of the group, the Jungfolk. And as for girls, a parallel organization was created, the League of German Girls. There were more than 25,000 Hitler Youth members by 1930, and membership swelled as Hitler's political fortunes took off. By 1936, membership in the Hitler Youth had been made mandatory for every young boy in Germany, whether his parents wanted him to join or not, as long as he was considered racially acceptable. Parents who declined to register their children for enrollment could face fines or imprisonment, 
No other youth organizations were even permitted to exist, so for many boys the Hitler Youth was the only way to participate in activities like sports and camping. But political, ideological, and racial training were always the main focus of the group. The entire reason for its existence was to teach children and young teenagers to be obedient Nazis, and members were even encouraged to inform on their parents if they voiced opposition to the Nazi party. Every member swore a personal oath of loyalty to Adolf Hitler as the savior of Germany. Once the war broke out, Hitler youth were given increasingly militaristic training. They learned how to use weapons and were taught basic assault tactics. Their trainings emphasized physical fitness, and they were subjected to army-style drills meant to teach them total and automatic obedience to orders. Above all, they were taught that it was their duty to sacrifice their lives for the fatherland. In 1943, as the war turned increasingly against Germany, an entire SS division was formed from Hitler Youth members. The 12th SS Hitler Jugend. The recruits were supposed to be at least 17 years old, but many boys 16 and under joined its ranks. In 1944, the division was sent to Normandy to hold the town of Caen against British and Canadian attacks. There, in the dense urban terrain, its young soldiers fought fanatically, often recklessly, showing just how far their indoctrination had gone. Often, they fought on after all hope of victory was gone, refusing to retreat or surrender. Allied soldiers remembered being forced to kill boys young enough to be their sons. In a month of hard fighting, well over half the division's young men were killed or wounded. After refitting and receiving replacements, it would go on to fight in the Battle of the Bulge, again suffering appalling losses. The unit ended the war, making hopeless counterattacks in Austria. In the final desperate months of the war, the dying Reichs turned to younger and younger children. In the last surviving film footage of Hitler from March 20, 1945, the leader of Germany, looking feeble and exhausted, stands in front of a line of teenage boys. As the Soviet army prepares for its final offensive, the young fighters have been summoned for a medal ceremony and an opportunity to meet the man for whom they've all sworn to sacrifice everything. They've been selected as examples of Germany's brave youth to receive the Iron Cross for their heroism. Their faces beam with pride as Hitler shakes their hands. The most famous among them is Wilhelm Hubner, who at 16 years old was decorated for carrying messages from headquarters to forward positions under heavy fire and filling wheelbarrows full of weapons and supplies for the frontline troops. But the youngest boy present is Alfred Czech, aged only 12 years old. As the fighting in Silesia approached his family's farm, the young boy had seen a group of German soldiers under attack, taking casualties. Using his father's farm wagon and horses, Czech made several trips under enemy fire to collect the wounded and bring them back behind the lines for medical treatment, rescuing 12 men. In the film footage, Hitler pinches the boy's cheeks as he congratulates the young child soldier. Hubner, Czech, and the others receive their medals, share a meal with the Führer at which they recount their exploits, and then return to the fight. A month later, on April 20, 1945, Hitler's birthday, just 10 days before his death by suicide, Germany's increasingly helpless leader makes his last public appearance outside of his heavily fortified underground bunker. As Soviet artillery pummels Berlin and the suburbs of the city are turned into bloody battlegrounds, he again meets with Berlin's child soldiers, handing out medals and encouraging them to make the ultimate sacrifice for their country. Hitler will never again leave his bunker alive. Now, in the final weeks of the war, as Germany's situation crumbles, children are enlisted wholesale. The Volkssturm is routinely drafting children as young as 12. Allied soldiers report encountering armed enemies as young as 8. Thousands of young boys are pulled directly out of grade school, given little to no training, handed weapons, and sent directly into combat against the unstoppable Red Army. In Berlin, entire battalions of young Hitler Youth boys are formed and told to hold the vital bridges that allow reinforcements into the city. Reinforcements that existed only on paper. Others are told to ambush Soviet troops as they advance down Berlin's broad, rubble-filled streets. Some young children are even formed into suicide squads and told to charge Soviet tanks with grenades. Parties of SS soldiers roam the ruined city seeking out deserters. They execute them, shooting them or hanging them from lampposts as an example to others that desertion offers no way out. Even the youngest soldiers are executed for giving in to fear. By now, Berlin is under constant bombardment by Soviet artillery, and the Red Army is in the process of surrounding the city. They punch through the feeble defenses in the suburbs and begin their bloody assault into the urban center. The German defenders, from little boys and girls up to gray-haired elders, fight tenaciously, but there is no hope of success. Slowly, bloodily, the Soviet forces conquer the city block by block until the last Nazi resistance is holed up in government buildings in the center of town. Some of the most zealous defenders make their final stand in the heavily fortified Reichstag, 
once the seat of the German government before the 1933 fire, now has been turned into a deadly fortress. Soviet infantry assault the massive building, clearing it out in brutal room-to-room -room combat over the course of several days, and at last the remnants of the German high command surrender the city. The Germans lose more than 100,000 military personnel defending Berlin, including thousands of children, and nearly 200,000 civilians are killed. The Soviet army loses more than 75,000 dead and 300,000 wounded. Once the fighting finally stops, Soviet troops embark on an orgy of looting and raping throughout the shattered city, terrorizing the survivors. On the 7th of May 1945, when all remaining German forces surrender, the Nazi Third Reich, which was to last a thousand years, is no more. But for the children who were thrown into the last bloody defense of their homeland, their lives are forever scarred. Thousands of them were killed in battle and many thousands more spent years in Soviet captivity. 12-year-old Alfred Czech would be shot through the lung while fighting in what would become the Czech Republic, and spent the next two years in a prisoner of war camp. He would return home and find that his father had been drafted into the Volkssturm in the final weeks of fighting and killed in combat. Like Czech, those who eventually made it home found their country occupied and divided between East and West. Like so many others, Germany's child soldiers would spend the rest of their lives trying to come to terms with the enormity of what had happened to Germany and their own roles in one of the most brutal, inhuman regimes in history. Hitler, a man so evil he ruined an entire mustache style. If anyone deserved to die, this man was it. Here's the craziest ways history's most notorious villain was almost rubbed out. Bad Schnitzel Way back when Hitler was first embarking into politics, some brave citizen heard Hitler speak and smelled trouble for Germany. This prompted the unknown individual or group of individuals to try and eliminate Hitler before it was too late. As Hitler and his staff had dinner at the Hotel Kaiserhof in Berlin, they shortly after became seriously ill. Poisoning was immediately suspected, but alas, whoever carried out the assassination attempt failed to realize that Hitler was a vegetarian and thus was spared. Next time a vegan tries to tell you meat is murder, remind them that vegetables basically killed over 40 million people in World War II. The pen is mightier than the sword, especially if it's poisoned. It takes a special kind of man for people to want to kill you twice in the same year. In February of 1932, Ludwig Asner, a member of the Bavarian State Parliament, didn't exactly like the cut of Hitler's jib. He penned a poisoned letter to Hitler, but an acquaintance of Asner spilled the tea and the letter was intercepted. Mercenary Death In 1934, Hitler had been named Chancellor of Germany, but not everyone was triumphantly throwing up their arms in Nazi salutes. In fact, many political and military leaders were extremely wary of Hitler and his Nazi government. To solve this little problem, Hitler kicked off what would become known as the Night of the Long Knives, a series of political killings that effectively eliminated or silenced any opposition to Hitler. Beppo Romer, a member of a German mercenary unit, vowed revenge. He and a group of men made plans to kill Hitler, but sadly the Gestapo would catch on to the plot before any real progress had been made. Sometimes crazy can take care of crazy, or at least try to. Murder from within When Romer failed to kill Hitler, Helmut Milius, a member of the right-wing radical small class party, took matters into his own hand. Under his direction, 160 men infiltrated the SS in order to conduct secret surveillance on Hitler. Milius quickly learned Hitler's schedule and daily routines, allowing him to plot the perfect time to kill him. Yet again, the Gestapo, who we have to admit was super on the ball, discovered the plot and put a stop to it. Milius managed to avoid any serious punishment due to the influence of German Field Marshal Erich von Manstein, who would go on to be one of Germany's best generals in the Second World War. Allegiance to country, not a man. A year later, a group of government officials from the German Foreign Office knew that they had to act to prevent a disaster. They weren't buying Hitler's Make Germany Great Again and insisted that Hitler was leading the company to disaster, not a resurgence of her glorious imperial days. They knew they had to do something to save the nation they loved, even if it meant killing the man who now ruled it. The group attempted to drum up support with a letter where they penned, The oath of allegiance to Hitler has lost its meaning since he's ready to sacrifice Germany. Sadly, the plot never took off and the world hurtled ever forward into global war. Explosive Briefcases By 1936, Hitler had whipped up hatred for Jews across much of Germany, and German Jew Helmut Hirsch knew he had to act. He filled two suitcases with explosives with a plan to plant them inside the Nazi party headquarters in Nuremberg. Unfortunately, a Gestapo informant learned of the plot and Hirsch was discovered. Pronounced guilty, Hirsch was executed via beheading, a far better fate than many of his fellow Jews would suffer in the years to come. Back to the crazy though, our next assassin thought he could kill two birds with one stone. Crazy Killer 
you know you're a terrible person when even insane people want you dead. That's exactly what happened in November of 1937, when mental patient Joseph Thomas traveled all the way to Berlin to shoot Hitler. However, Thomas also had a beef with the Nazi head of the Air Force, Hermann Göring, and plotted to assassinate both on the same day. Discovered by police, Thomas spilled the beans on himself, putting an end to the plot. Interestingly enough, it may have been a good thing that Göring was in fact not killed by Thomas. In the build-up to the war, under Göring's direction, the Luftwaffe did not add any significant number of long-range heavy bombers to its fleet, a move that would haunt Germany during the Battle of England, as it was forced to attack with light and medium bombers only. Further, Göring's inflated ego assured Hitler that his Luftwaffe would be able to keep German troops under siege in Russia supplied, and thus Hitler did not dispatch ground forces to relieve them. This strategic blunder would spell disaster for over 100,000 German soldiers and for the war effort against the Soviet Union. That one time the Allies saved Hitler's life. Yeah, you heard that right. The same Allies that Hitler would go on to nearly crush saved Hitler's life just before the war began. In September of 1938, conservatives in the German army feared what a renewed war against the Western Allies might do to the nation. They could smell disaster on the horizon, despite all the Nazi propaganda to the contrary. They vowed to enact a coup the moment Hitler declared war on Czechoslovakia, eliminating Hitler and placing the exiled Wilhelm II back on the throne as emperor. Much to their astonishment, Britain and France agreed to the annexation of the Sudetenland in a bid to appease Hitler, and thus the risk of war was temporarily removed. The group nixed their plans to replace Hitler, for the time being. That wouldn't be the last time the Allies saved Hitler's life. But next is an assassin who wanted to kill Hitler for pretty wild reasons. Killing Hitler in order to make Russia great again? Maurice Bavaud was a Swiss theology student and a member of an anti-communist group in France. The group's leader, Marcel Gerbohe, convinced Bavaud and others that he was in fact a member of the Romanov dynasty who had escaped execution at the hands of the dirty Bolsheviks. In fact, Gerbohe was full of Bolshevik himself. But that didn't stop him from convincing Bavaud that if he murdered Hitler it would somehow help hint communism in Russia and the Romanovs could retake the country for themselves. As if that would be much better. Bavaud traveled to Germany in 1938 and bought a pistol, then remarked to a policeman how he'd like to meet Hitler personally. The police officer suggested he travel to Munich for the anniversary of the 1923 Beer Hall Putsch, which Hitler attended every year. Bavoud bought himself a ticket to the event on the reviewing stand and posed as a reporter, prepared to bust a cap the moment Hitler strolled by. Unfortunately, Bavoud aborted the attempt as Hitler was in company of other Nazis that Bavoud didn't want to accidentally injure, which makes about as much sense to us as it does to you. Bavoud now used the last remaining bit of his money to purchase expensive stationery and forged a letter of introduction under the name of French nationalist leader and friend to the Nazi, Pierre Titongy. He took the letter with the hopes of using it to gain an audience with Hitler to Berchtesgaden, but Hitler had decided to remain in Munich. Broke and destitute, Bavoud was forced to stow away on a train to Paris, but was discovered by the conductor. Interrogated by the Gestapo, who again were seriously on the ball, Bavoud admitted to the assassination plot and was executed. Hitler's abundant and incredible luck. Back in World War I, Hitler narrowly avoided being exploded after the exact spot he'd been standing in just moments prior became ground zero for a British artillery round. The explosive luck, get it, would last well into Hitler's life and pay off yet again in October 1939. On a victory parade of Warsaw after Hitler's conquest of Poland, Polish Army General Michael Karasowicz Tokarewski hatched a plan to blow Hitler sky high with explosives buried under his parade route. In a stroke of insane luck, Hitler's parade was diverted at the last minute and completely avoided the planted explosives. And because life is 100% not fair, history's biggest a-hole also happened to be history's luckiest man. Even more explosive luck. Just a month after being nearly blown up, Hitler was once again nearly blown up. For weeks, German carpenter George Elser planned the construction of a timed bomb inside one of Germany's largest beer halls, where he knew Der Fuhrer would soon be making his annual speech in commemoration of the Beer Hall Putsch. The bomb was planted just a few feet away from where Hitler would eventually stand, its timer muffled by a cork. The bomb was timed to go off right in the middle of Hitler's speech, but with World War II on his mind, Hitler cut his speech off early and rushed back to Berlin to convene with his military leaders. Instead of Hitler, the bomb killed eight others and injured over 60, with the ceiling collapsing right where Hitler had been standing. 
The subsequent crackdown by the Gestapo made the components needed to create explosives so difficult that multiple other assassination attempts in the works had to be cancelled after the organizers were unable to get their hands on the needed explosives. If you fail, try, try again. In 1939, Beppo Romer was released from prison for his 1934 attempt to murder Hitler. Apparently either the authorities had not been too impressed with Romer or were convinced that he was a reformed man. They would be extremely wrong. Romer joined a resistance group of German intellectuals named the Soul Circle who were dedicated to opposing the Nazi party at every possible opportunity. The group tracked Hitler's movements carefully, but Hitler's security had been dramatically increased due to all the pesky attempts on his life. Failing to find an opportunity to strike, the Soul Circle was eventually discovered and its members arrested in a Gestapo sting. The Soul Circle members were betrayed from within by a Gestapo spy, pretending to be a Swiss sympathizer, and most would meet their end via torture and execution. There was the one time Hitler was almost blown up by his own tanks. Even his own army wanted him dead. Many German generals were starting to warm up to the fact that Hitler was leading their nation to disaster by 1943. A group of them plotted to arrest Hitler upon his visit to a military detachment in Ukraine. One general's tanks would surround Hitler and his escorts completely, and if Hitler refused to surrender they would simply kill everyone. Hitler's visit was cancelled at the last minute, and once more Das Führer escaped certain death. Multiple attempts all in the same day. March 13, 1943 would be the day Hitler would evade certain death three times, and he never even had a clue. First, a group of officers vowed to kill Hitler as he drove from the airport to a local army headquarters. Hitler, however, was accompanied by a heavy SS escort and the plan was cancelled. Briefly delayed to lunch, a new plan was put into effect. During their lunch together at a specified signal, several officers would rise and fire their pistols at Hitler. Hitler, however, was a no-show and the plan was cancelled. In a last-ditch effort to kill the luckiest SOB in history, a bomb was camouflaged as liquor bottles and planted on Hitler's airplane. The timer was set to blow as the plane was in flight and over Poland. However, the plane's hold iced over from the extreme temperatures and the fuse of the bomb failed. Our next killer's weapon of choice would be hugging and explosives. The Death Hug Hitler's luck was so unbelievable that we wouldn't blame you for fact-checking us on the sheer number of times Hitler avoided death purely by coincidence. Just a week after he was almost gunned down twice and then blown out of the sky, Hitler would evade death yet again. German officer Rudolf Christoph Freiherr von Gerstorf decided Hitler had to go at any cost. Hitler, along with several prominent Nazi and military figures, planned to visit Gerstorf at a Berlin armory where they could inspect captured Soviet weapons. Gerstorf then set about packing his coat pockets with time-delayed explosives, set for 10 minutes. Just as Hitler arrived, Gerstorf set off the timers, with a plan to hug Hitler right before the explosives went off in order to ensure his death. It would be a suicide attack, but a necessary sacrifice for Germany. Incredibly, Hitler breezed through the entire exhibition in less than 10 minutes, which prompted Gerstorf to rush to a bathroom in order to disarm the explosives. The Allies save Hitler's life again. In late 1943, the Allies were pushing back hard against the Luftwaffe's domination of Europe's skies. This opened up opportunities for Allied planes to raid German infrastructure. One such raid would end up saving Hitler's life. The German army was preparing to put out a new winter uniform, and Major Axel von den Busche was chosen to model it for Hitler in a private viewing. Busche was tall, handsome and blonde, and blue-eyed, basically the perfect Nazi in Hitler's view. But Busch actually planned to kill Hitler during the viewing by detonating a mine he would be carrying in his backpack. The planned viewing, however, was cancelled when an Allied air raid destroyed the rail car containing the new uniforms. Hitler immune to explosives By 1944, it was clear that Germany was losing the war. It was largely due to Hitler's ineptitude as a military leader. A group of senior German military officials concocted what would be known as Operation Valkyrie, as they attempted to kill Hitler and make peace with the Western Allies as soon as possible in order to avoid the complete destruction of Germany. The conspirators managed to plant a 2.2-pound bomb in a briefcase inside a meeting room where Hitler and his senior military advisors would discuss the ongoing war. Incredibly, Colonel Heinz Brandt is believed to have nudged the briefcase behind one of the legs of the table, effectively deflecting the bomb blast and sparing Hitler's life. It's just days before Operation Overlord, better known in the history books as D-Day. Over one million men from five different nations will simultaneously launch several landings 
across the French coast, a military operation the likes of which has never been attempted before. Waiting across the English Channel are several hundred thousand German defenders, sitting in heavily fortified bunkers, overseeing beaches littered with mines, barbed wire, and concrete tank traps. Hitler and his generals know that an invasion is coming. Up until now, the war has been largely Britain fighting for her life, with the Soviets in the Far East being easily defeated. The Americans have conducted several operations in northern Africa with very mixed success, but now the bulk of their forces are finally in Britain, eager to join the fight. Any day now the true battle of Europe will begin and the Germans hold all the advantages. Suddenly, German radio operators begin picking up radio chatter from American and British units. The operators are quick to identify several of the Allied units broadcasting, including several American and British infantry divisions, armored divisions, and even General Patton's headquarters itself. The alarm is immediately raised. Something big is going down, and soon. The Luftwaffe is ordered to put recon planes up into the air, and as they make the short trip across the channel, they take photos of column after column of tanks, trucks, and artillery, all lined up and ready to board landing craft. German Army headquarters is immediately alerted to the pending invasion, and General Rommel himself orders reinforcements to rush to Calais, directly across from the preparing invaders. He even commits the bulk of his armor reserve to the area. The Allies must not be allowed to gain so much as a toehold on Europe. They must be met directly on the beach and thrown back into the ocean. Another reconnaissance flight over the massing forces is ordered, and the pilot confirms the locations of the Allied forces, reporting thousands of armored vehicles and trucks waiting to be loaded. As the plane turns around from overflying the mass troops, a stiff wind suddenly picks up and one of the tanks starts to float away. Hurrying, a soldier ducks out from under a tent and rushes to the tank, tying it down with a rope and securing it from the stiff breeze. Luckily, the German plane seems to have taken no notice of the peculiar incident. As Germany prepares to defeat the largest invasion in military history, there's just one problem. The American and British tanks and other vehicles are all made of rubber, barely more than inflatable balloons. The giant invasion army is fake a ploy engineered by the British and carried out with the help of the US's 23rd Headquarters Special Troops. And the real invasion force is massing right now for a landing dozens of miles away in Normandy, known as the Ghost Army. The 23rd Headquarters Special Troops was a military outfit like no other. Its members were men specifically recruited from the world of advertisement, visual arts of all sorts, carpenters, and talented actors. Their job was simple fool the Germans by pretending to be something they were not, and the 1,100-strong unit was tasked with staging elaborate displays that would make the Germans believe they were facing a much larger threat than they really were, making use of inflatable tanks, rubber airplanes, and plywood artillery. Officially known as tactical deception, this elite troop of soldiers would be critical in confusing and confounding the German military throughout the course of the war. The Ghost Army ultimately staged 20 battlefield deceptions between 1944 and 1945. Their performances or illusions, as the members insisted on calling their cunning tricks, would often take place within just a few hundred yards of enemy lines, putting them in just as much risk as any regular soldier. Yet unlike regular soldiers, if the enemy didn't fall for the trick, they might be left with nothing more than rubber tanks to fight with. In order to fool the Germans, the Ghost Army created something called Atmosphere, a term familiar to any theater or film artist. In essence, atmosphere simply means creating a believable tone or impression for the audience, and in this case, the audience was German military units and undercover spies. To do this, the members of the Ghost Army would wear uniforms from different military units and make sure they were seen marching by enemy scouts. The scouts would then return back to their headquarters and report that members of a specific unit were operating in the local area. While the real unit, along with all its firepower, was in actuality somewhere else entirely. This would lead the Germans to deploy their forces to defend from imaginary threats, fearing for instance an attack by an American armored division when in reality that same division was preparing to attack somewhere else far away. To help sell the illusion though, the soldiers of the Ghost Army would drive trucks or tanks, sometimes as few as just two, in constant looping convoys, creating the illusion of a much larger unit being transported to the front lines. The clever actors would also learn to impersonate radio operators from different units, mimicking not just their voice, but also the way that they sent Morse code messages, down to every minute idiosyncrasy of the specific operator. All these tiny details would add up to a very convincing deception, leaving the Germans utterly confused as to the real state of affairs across the combat front. 
Ghost Army soldiers would also put their acting talents to use in person, often spending time at French cafes near the war front, where they knew they would be overheard by German spies. The soldiers would wear uniforms of different infantry or armored divisions, again sowing confusion as to the true location of the real units, and they would talk loudly and openly about upcoming tactical operations. Commensurate actors, the Ghosters would learn their roles well, playing everything from overexcited new recruits eager to see their first combat and accidentally spilling operational secrets, to even high-ranking generals bragging about upcoming operations to pretty waitresses, while knowing that a German spy would certainly be within earshot. Sometimes, though, it was just enough to be seen and not heard, and soldiers would often parade around pretending to be very high-ranking Allied officers, making German spies believe that major operations must be about to take place in areas where no such operations were being planned. If you've ever acted in a school play and thought it was nerve-wracking, imagine trying to play the part of a very high-ranking officer in World War II, knowing that your performance could save or doom thousands of lives. Ghost Army soldiers used every range of their artistic talent in the fight to liberate Europe, and this included audio engineers. Today, you might hold yourself up in a room with some music software and cook up some sick beats to get a few likes on Facebook. But for the soldiers of the Ghost Army, creating convincing mixtapes made up of the sounds of different vehicles and tanks could mean the difference between life and death. These soldiers worked in conjunction with Bell Labs back in Fort Knox and recorded dozens of different types of military vehicles, everything from tanks to trucks and even jeeps. The recordings were written directly into wire recorders, bleeding edge technology at the time, and then transported to the battlefields of Europe. A modern DJ may have to mix different tracks together to entertain an audience, but in World War II, the Ghost Army's own DJs would be tasked with mixing all the different recordings of armored vehicles to create a realistic soundscape of an advancing army. If the recordings or the mixing just wasn't right, the entire ploy could collapse, and Ghost Army soldiers had to do this with primitive equipment mounted on the back of a half-track loaded with giant speakers. No doubt a difficult task. The tactic was nevertheless effective in fooling the Germans several times, and the recordings could be heard as far away as 15 miles, giving the impression of a very large force moving through the thick woods of Europe's forests. Another brainchild of the Ghost Army was spoof radio, and it used actors impersonating radio operators from other units. They would do everything from report fake troop movements to even calling in fake radio reports from imaginary combat zones complete with a soundscape of battlefield noises to make the performance believable. Thus, German units might be fooled into thinking that American forces were retreating by picking up the broadcast of a panicked soldier calling for a retreat, when in actuality the forces were digging in to lure the Germans into a trap, or weren't even in the area at all. The fake battlefield broadcasts also confused the Germans, making them believe that their own units, which were not engaged in battle, had been engaged. Confused German commanders would be forced to contact individual units to try and clear the fog of war, leaving opportunities for Allied troops to act before the Germans could properly react. Spoof radio was so successful that it even fooled Axis Sally, otherwise known as Mildred Gillers, an American woman turned Nazi propagandist. She would go on to report that an entire Allied division was preparing for battle at a place with no troops at all. Ghost Army soldiers would often protect other soldiers in a much more active way, though. During D-Day and several other major operations, Ghost Army artists created realistic-looking decoys that became tempting bombing and artillery targets for the Germans. This would include artillery emplacements, fake landing barges, and groups of parked vehicles. The elaborate displays would sometimes even be lit up with lights, as if someone was being accidentally careless, making them that much more tempting for the Germans to strike at. Attacks on these fake military positions saved countless Allied lives. Sometimes, though, ghost soldiers would simply mirror pre-existing positions, such as artillery sites, diverting fire from the real emplacement, and once more, saving lives. As the fight for Europe moved to the east, so too did the Ghost Army. In September after the D-Day landings, the Ghost Army impersonated the entirety of the 6th Armored Division, effectively plugging a gap in General Patton's assault on the French city of Metz. German forces looked for a vulnerability to exploit, and instead were faced with a continuous line of American forces, leaving them no room to outmaneuver the American advance. Had the Germans not fallen for the ruse, they would certainly have broken through the American lines and flanked the real attack by General Patton, potentially dooming the entire assault. Imagine being the German general who would learn later after the war that rubber tanks were what defeated him in one of the pivotal battles for Europe. 
Yet, as impressive as the Ghost Army's deceptions were up to this point, one of their greatest illusions would take place toward the end of the war. In March 1945, Allied forces were preparing to cross the Rhine River, and at last into the heart of Germany itself. Victory was within sight, if they could just get across the very heavily fortified Rhine. Any attempt to cross would be bloody, with casualties projected in the tens of thousands, and yet the attack was necessary to finally bring an end to World War II. The Ghost Army would play their part in the attack, and were tasked with the incredible job of simulating two entire infantry divisions, or about 20,000 men and all their equipment, with just 1,100 soldiers. The Ghost Army would set upon the impossible task with gusto, calling on every ounce of artistic creativity to fool the Germans into believing the main assault across the Rhine would come far away from the actual attack. To do this, they ran a mounting concert of radio broadcasts, simulating troop movements and orders between different brigade and division commanders, a performance that convinced the Germans real units were moving into the area. Across the river, the Ghost Army blasted its carefully mixed soundtrack of troops, vehicles, and heavy equipment, making sentries posted along the Rhine believe that just across the river from them, the illusionary divisions were preparing for an attack. The deceit worked perfectly, and incredibly, when the real American units made their crossing of the Rhine, they encountered little, if any, resistance, laying bare Germany's heart. The Ghost Army is credited with saving tens of thousands of lives and helping ensure victory in World War II. Its soldiers were certainly cut from a different cloth, being professional and amateur actors, painters, and artists of all sorts, and bringing their incredible talents to their nation's aid in one of the darkest times in modern history. Their contribution to victory, however, is likely best immortalized in the results of the D-Day invasions, when even as the main assault force was making landfall in Normandy, the Germans refused to send reinforcements, believing the real attack to be a diversion for the fake attack by rubber tanks waiting for them across the channel. Most gravestones are a site of solemn remembrance, where mourners bring flowers and share memories. However, there are some people whose graves would be more likely to become public graffiti targets. No one more than Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler. But no one's defacing Hitler's grave, because he doesn't have one. Which raises one big question, what happened to Hitler's body? It was 1945 and the walls were closing in on the Nazi regime. The Soviet Red Army was marching in from the east, having liberated Poland. The attempt by the Nazis to bomb Britain into submission had long since failed, and now the unified forces of Britain, the US, and the rest of their allies were marching on Germany from the west. Hitler was surrounded and increasingly paranoid, and had retreated to his bunker, an air raid shelter in Berlin. As the Soviets approached the city, Hitler discovered that even his own generals were starting to reject his orders. He was determined not to be taken alive. As Hitler planned to end his life rather than be taken alive, multiple Nazi leaders jockeyed for position. Hermann Göring attempted to take control in the aftermath, and was rewarded by being stripped of his offices by Hitler and arrested. As communications around the city were cut off, Hitler heard bits and pieces of news about his top allies surrendering, with Heinrich Himmler even claiming that he had a right to negotiate a surrender of the regime. Hitler also heard word that his closest ally, Benito Mussolini, had been deposed and killed by Italian rebels. It was time for his last rites. Within his bunker, Hitler and his longtime mistress, Eva Braun, were married, and then Hitler dictated his last will and testament to his secretary. Knowing the end was near, he was determined he wouldn't allow his enemies to get a hold of him and execute him or put him on trial. He'd already obtained capsules of poison from Himmler before Himmler's attempted surrender, but now doubted if they'd be effective or if they were just another betrayal. So he gave them to his beloved dog Blondie, and the dog died immediately, adding just one final casualty to Hitler's long list of kills. He soon said his goodbyes, retreated to his room with Eva Braun, and prepared for the end. What happened next has been debated for almost 80 years. The leader of the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin, was a ruthless man, and he wanted his revenge on Hitler for the Nazis' betrayal. He'd offered a medal to the person who found Hitler alive as they surged into Berlin, and Stalin hoped to capture him alive and make an example of him. But it wasn't to be. According to witnesses in the bunker, Hitler's valet entered the chamber and immediately smelled gunpowder and a strange burnt almond smell. Both Hitler and Braun were dead. Braun apparently from poisoning as she had no visible wounds, while Hitler was bleeding from a fresh wound to his temple and had a gun at his feet. The Nazi leader and his new wife were apparently serious about not being taken alive. And there was a plan as soon as the news broke. The Nazi leaders knew Hitler's body would be of great interest to the Allies, and they didn't want them to get a hold of it. Led by the acting Nazi leader Joseph Goebbels, 
The Nazis on site rolled the bodies up in a rug, gathered papers covered in petrol, and lit the entire thing on fire. This took place amid heavy Allied shelling in the area, which shows just how loyal Hitler's diehards were. They were willing to carry out these bizarre funeral rites even as their own lives were endangered. While Hitler's body wasn't totally destroyed by the burning, it was now unrecognizable, and was buried in a bomb crater along with the rug soaked with his blood. And that was the end of the story. Or at least it should have been. Soon the Soviets took control of Berlin and news that Hitler was already dead did not make Stalin happy. The word spread of Hitler's death, and millions of German troops left the battlefield to avoid the Soviet forces. It would be several days before the Soviets arrived at the compound, and they dug up what was believed to be Hitler and Braun's dental remains. A cursory analysis identified Hitler's body which seemed to put things to rest, but Stalin had other ideas. It just seemed too easy, didn't it? Hitler had terrorized the continent and beyond for 12 years and now he's dead, with no way to hold him accountable for his crimes. That sounded like exactly what he'd want them to think. Many Soviet operations in the area continued to dig up the bodies of the Nazi leadership. But it's not clear if they found any more of Hitler's body beyond what was believed to be his teeth. And without more proof, Stalin refused to believe his nemesis was truly gone. And as Stalin spoke, millions of people listened. And so began the great Hitler conspiracy battle. Early polls showed that over two-thirds of Americans thought Hitler might still be alive in June 1945, but the leadership didn't seem to share those doubts. The same couldn't be said for the Soviet Union, where Joseph Stalin actively spread the conspiracies. In fact, only a month after the discovery of dental remains, Stalin ordered his field marshal Georgi Zhukov to present details on how Hitler could have survived. And a month after that, Stalin stated at the Potsdam Conference that Hitler had probably escaped to Spain or Argentina like so many other Nazi leaders. And this had some unintended consequences. Conspiracy theories don't stay where they're supposed to. Stalin's motivation for insisting Hitler was alive might have been because he wasn't willing to give up on bringing the Nazi leader to justice, but there were also still a lot of loyalists to Hitler. Soon enough, the former Nazi ambassador to Vichy France, Otto Abetz, was claiming that Hitler was still alive, just in hiding. Soon the Allied forces were dealing with a more active Nazi resistance, not willing to give up the war because after all, if their leader was still alive then they hadn't actually lost the war. It got intense enough that governments had to get involved. With the Soviets consistently boosting the conspiracy theory that Hitler was alive, the British counterintelligence division in Berlin launched an investigation. They found no conclusive evidence that Hitler was still alive, but that didn't stop the conspiracies. The official report stated that the desire to invent legends and fairy tales is greater than the love of the truth, which is probably proven right every time someone watches an infomercial for a miracle product and then picks up the phone immediately. Even after the investigation, almost half of the US population still believed the conspiracy and it was about to get a major boost. It was only a year after the war when letters started going out around the country from someone calling himself Furrier No. 1. The mysterious madman not only claimed to be Hitler, but insisted he was living in Kentucky, under an assumed name with Eva Braun, and had not given up the war effort. The Furrier claimed to be building tunnels under Washington, D.C., and to be armed with sleeper cells and nuclear bombs, and even invisible spaceships to take the Nazi regime to space. Needless to say, the writer wasn't Hitler. He was a miner and a Baptist preacher who used his scam to defraud supporters of $15,000 before being arrested for mail fraud. But the next conspiracy would have more meat on the bones. Arthur F. Mackensen wasn't a big wig in the German military during World War II, just a lieutenant, but he claimed that fate put him in the most important role of all. In 1948, he spoke to major newspapers and claimed that on May 5, 1945, five days after Hitler's supposed death, he had fled to Berlin in tanks alongside Nazi official Martin Bormann, Hitler and Eva Braun, who had faked their deaths. They flew to Denmark, and Hitler and Braun then boarded a submarine to Argentina. The only problem with this? Not only was there no record of this crazy escape mission, but there was no record of Arthur F. Mackensen, who might have been named after First World War Field Marshal August von Mackensen. So the entire affair might have been a creative work of fiction by some newspaper writers who definitely sold papers off it. The question for these conspiracists is, if Hitler survived and escaped, whose body was dug up in that Berlin bomb crater? For the conspiracy theorists, the answer is simple. He obviously planned ahead. Hitler was known to be paranoid and frequently was surrounded by food tasters, bodyguards, even body doubles to prevent him from being assassinated. While it worked, none of them could save him from his fate in that Berlin bunker, 
unless they did. The idea is that one of Hitler's body doubles died in his place, allowing their bodies to be burned and then discovered, only for the real Hitler to escape to a safe place for former Nazis. And the conspiracies would continue for years. During the 1950s, the FBI and CIA constantly received tips that Hitler was alive, often living in the United States. Maybe that man at the grocery store had a slightly suspicious mustache. Maybe that traffic cop was a little too into order when he gave someone that ticket. All these tips were taken by the government, briefly investigated, and quickly dumped in the circular storage file. But that didn't stop the paranoia. The conspiracy about Hitler still being alive made it all the way to the Nuremberg trial, where one judge briefly examined the evidence. But in 1956, the West German judicial system issued a final report stating that the circumstances of Hitler's death were exactly what everyone thought they were. And that should put an end to the conspiracies, right? While the Allies were mostly united on the fact that Hitler was dead, the Soviets had a different opinion. The question is, why? Stalin likely saw the exact same evidence everyone else did but he had an ulterior motive for keeping the truth muddled. After all, if Hitler was supposedly still alive, he had a reason to keep a heavier hand on occupied Germany. From the start, he was obstructing investigations of Hitler's bunker, only briefly allowing a limited investigation of the site months after the fact. While they found some evidence of Hitler and Braun's belongings in the ruins, they would have no chance to investigate them, and the Soviets quickly barred them from the grounds again on shady accusations. But behind the scenes, a different picture was forming. By the end of 1945, Stalin wanted the truth, so he ordered his intelligence agencies to launch a second investigation. This time, they used modern science to comb every corner of the bunker and gather evidence pointing to Hitler's death. To start, they took blood samples from the sofa and the wall where Hitler supposedly died. They tested the blood type and found it was a match to Hitler's type A blood. They dug through the crater again and found fragments of a skull, which had damage from a bullet wound. It was pretty strong evidence that Hitler had died in the bunker just like all the non-conspiracy theorists knew. But it wouldn't be enough to put the issue to rest completely. Because there was one question still to be answered. Hitler hadn't survived the end of World War II, and there was no real evidence that he ever had. The conspiracy was a product of a combination of Soviet disinformation and Nazi wish fulfillment, combined with the successful escapes of many lower-profile Nazis like Adolf Eichmann and Joseph Mengele to South America. But while they weren't household names, Hitler avoiding detection while the whole world was looking for him was highly unlikely. But while everyone knew he wasn't alive, they still didn't know exactly where he was, because Hitler's body was essentially disappeared by the Soviets. He died in the bunker, and then his body was exhumed and examined by the Soviets, at which point it just disappeared. The decision to not have any sort of memorial was undoubtedly the correct one. After all, not only did he not deserve one, but a gravestone would become a rallying point for neo-Nazis. But many people wanted more transparency, and they were not going to get it from people responsible for investigating Hitler's death because they were among the most feared spy agencies to ever grace the planet. And no, they weren't the KGB. The People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, usually referred to as the NKVD, was the internal security spy agency for the Soviets. Similar to the FBI, it handled domestic affairs while the KGB handled foreign affairs. Unlike the FBI, it had a near-universal authority, and there was usually no appeals process when they got their hands on you. Not only did they take responsibility for the nation's regular police work when they were created in 1917, but they also oversaw the prison and labor camp systems. While they were eventually disbanded, Joseph Stalin brought them back stronger than ever and made them the country's official secret police. They were responsible for the investigation of Hitler's death and for the disposal of the body. And if you had any questions, the NKVD would answer by sending you to a work camp. Around the same time as Hitler investigations were ramping up, the NKVD became the Ministry of Internal Affairs, and Stalin's brutal repression of his own country ramped up. The Hitler remains went uncatalogued and became just another artifact within the Russian state archives. And much of the archives, which contained documents from pre-Soviet Russia and the height of the empire, were sealed up tight until the Soviet Union collapsed in the early 1990s. In the chaos of the aftermath, people had other things on their mind beyond the remains of the Nazi dictator from the 1940s. But that would change with one big discovery. In 1993, the bone fragments that were used to identify Hitler and Eva Braun's remains resurfaced in the archives, and interest in the case surged once again. Suddenly, everyone was taking a look back at all the research and the theories about the Nazi leader's death for the last half century. The most prominent work of literature about the events was The Death of Adolf Hitler by Russian journalist Lev Beziaminsky. He detailed a supposed Soviet investigation, top secret of course, that shed more light on the causes of Hitler's death. Details included Hitler's supposed death by cyanide poisoning, 
which turned out to be long and painful. The book was dramatic and also likely completely false, as no evidence of the secret investigation surfaced and other historians criticized it as a work of fiction. But in the 90s, things would change once again. The archives were now wide open, and as Russia opened to the world under Boris Yeltsin, the true investigations came to light. What was originally a dossier would be published in 2005 under the title The Hitler Book, and it revealed exactly what Stalin had wanted to know about Hitler. And it seemed the answer was… everything. Originally classified and in the archives since the time of Nikita Khrushchev, the dossier was over 400 pages long. It confirmed that Stalin originally believed that Hitler had escaped and that the Allies in the West were hiding him. Which raises a question. How do you tell a dictator that he is completely wrong without being shipped off to Siberia? The report was put together when the Soviets had control of Berlin, and it took four years before it was presented to Stalin in 1949. It started as an investigation into Hitler's death, but there really wasn't all that much meat there. And they couldn't go back to Stalin with a one-pager that stated Hitler was dead as suspected. So the report turned into an elaborate look into Hitler's reign in power from 1933 to 1945, and incorporated hundreds of secret Nazi documents and interviews with imprisoned Nazi officials in Soviet gulags. So how did Stalin's personal report shape the debate? Historians believe the report was one of the most exhaustive looks into the Nazi political system, as well as into Hitler's declining mindset as the war went on. What is lacking, though, is a lot of political context. That's because it was written for an audience of one, and Stalin was one of the harshest literary critics out there. After all, if he didn't like what you wrote about him, you were headed to the gulag, not getting a bad review. So the report was haunted by political inaccuracies, including the deletion of the pact between Stalin and Hitler early in the war, and the Soviet Union's own anti-Semitism. Also, many of the interviews of Nazi officials were conducted under torture, so any information they gave has shaky reputability at best. And the one thing it didn't provide? Any evidence Hitler survived. Conspiracy theories persisted even amid more evidence, and newspapers like the Weekly World News frequently published fictional stories. Was Hitler living next door to Elvis in Florida? Probably not. But that would make it for a good sitcom premise. In fact, it did. An ill-advised British sitcom titled Hail Honey, I'm Home featured an undercover Hitler living in Britain in the years after the war. To add to another wacky wrinkle, his new neighbors were Jewish. Needless to say, the series did about as well as was expected. It became one of the very few shows to be cancelled after a single episode. But the actual truth is much less dramatic. From the start, the people who believed Hitler was dead relied on some key pieces of evidence. The first was the skull fragment with a bullet hole. But the most important piece was the jawbone fragment and dental bridges. Hitler's personal dentist and his associates who worked on the Nazi leader's dentistry over the years were able to examine them and identify them, and all came to the same conclusion. Hitler and Eva Braun died in that Berlin bunker after taking poison, with Hitler speeding up the process with a single bullet. But that still left the question of the rest of the body. While Hitler's body was burned, it was burned in open air and it wasn't likely to be largely destroyed in the same way cremated remains would be. It would be unrecognizable, but still identifiable as human remains. So, it's likely someone spirited off the rest of the remains, and in 2009 more details emerged. Russian General Vasily Kristoforov, then the head archivist of the Russian Federal Security Service, claimed the body had been in Soviet custody for the entirety of Stalin's reign and beyond, until the 1980s, when Yuri Andropov took over. The KGB took the body, burned it to nothing, and dumped the ashes into a German river. This ensured that no matter what happened, the neo-Nazis would never have a gathering place for Hitler's remains. And so closed the mystery for good. Right? Wrong. Because there was one last act. Philippe Chalier was quickly gaining a reputation as one of France's top forensic experts gaining renown for studying the remains of European royals. He worked on the remnants of kings, including Richard Lionheart and Louis IX, as well as proved several supposed relics of Joan of Arc to be forgeries. So, when the chance emerged to investigate the greatest mystery of the 20th century, he wasn't turning it down. And so began the final chapter of the story of Hitler's body, stretching all the way to 2017, over 70 years after the Nazi leader died. Was there a hidden secret that a forensic genius would discover? Nope. Using modern forensic science, Charlier was able to do a deeper analysis of the teeth fragments based on the documents of those who examined them previously and those who worked on Hitler. In every case, it proved a match that indicated Hitler died in 1945 and was buried in the shallow grave outside his bunker. 
with no further evidence found on Eva Braun's remains, all the conspiracy theories surrounding her center on her and Hitler escaping together, and so it's likely that that final day in the bunker played out exactly as the official story claimed decades ago. So that should put all those conspiracy theories to rest, right? One would think so, but conspiracies don't die easily. Any resolution to the theory that Hitler survived would be out of reach now anyway, as the Nazi leader would now be over 130 years old and long dead, even if he had managed to escape. While neo-Nazis still exist around the world, most of them have long since moved on to other leaders, and the Soviet Union's desire to control the narrative around Hitler's fate collapsed along with the Empire in the 90s. So, who would still have an interest in spreading this conspiracy? Well, the answer might surprise you. Sure, some of the sources were your typical Nazis who didn't admit that their idol had died like a coward in a Berlin bunker, or Soviet loyalists who didn't want to admit that he had died without seeking justice. But the larger, more common motivation was simply, it makes for a better story. If Hitler's story ends in 1945, there's nothing more to say but the post-mortem. But by creating the idea that there's a whole other chapter to his life, you can create a new narrative, no matter how fictionalized it might be. And that's exactly what one TV channel did. The History Channel. Sounds like a pretty credible name. Except that for the TV show Hunting Hitler and others, they've made most things up. Their source was some declassified FBI documents that investigated whether Hitler might have escaped Berlin, and the answer was a resounding no. But that didn't stop the network from crafting three seasons and a two-hour special out of the idea. Most of the evidence was circumstantial, exploring possible escape routes and landing places without revealing any concrete evidence that he had actually used any of them. But one other factor explains the persistence of these theories. Most wars, even world wars, are messy and a complicated mix of political factors and old grudges. The First World War's German leader Kaiser Wilhelm II was a relatively low-key figure in the public mind. But Hitler was an over-the-top evil leader equally obsessed with racial purity and determined to conquer all of Europe. Eventually, even his own military men hated him and tried to kill him. He was one of the most dramatic villains in the history of history, almost like a real-life supervillain. And what do supervillains do all the time? Survive certain death and return when the heroes least expect it. It's summer 1943, and the Allied forces have moved to secure the Mediterranean from the Axis powers once and for all. This means one thing, neutralizing Italy, a staunch German ally led by the fascist dictator Benito Mussolini, sweeping away the Italian navy, which performed atrociously against Allied forces. Allied soldiers at last began to make landfall on Sicily. From captured airfields, American and British bombers could now reach Rome, and an intense bombing campaign begins against Italy's capital. The intent is not so much to damage Italian industry and its warfighting ability, but rather to capitalize on the low morale of Italian troops and citizens and force them to overthrow Mussolini, thus suing for peace with the Allies. Throughout the war, aside from a few notable exceptions in Africa, Italian forces performed extremely poorly. And soon, Hitler was sending experienced officers to supervise his allies' military. The Germans saw it as a babysitting assignment, and the Italians were simply sick of war. They'd been lied to, after all. Mussolini had promised to turn the Mediterranean into a giant Italian lake, and now the Allies were on Italian territory. The time was ripe for revolution, and shortly after the beginning of the bombing campaign, the Italian government ousted Mussolini, imprisoning him on a mountaintop ski resort a secure prison for one of the world's most dangerous men. This was a disaster for Hitler, but he had one ace up his sleeve, a single man, Otto Skorzeny, possibly the most dangerous man of World War II. Skorzeny had made a name for himself as a firebrand Nazi and devout fascist, quickly climbing the ranks of the German military. Skorzeny's first ambition had been to become a pilot, and shortly after the invasion of Poland he had volunteered for the Luftwaffe, but was denied for being too tall. At 6 foot 4 inches, Otto was a formidable man indeed, and when his imposing bulk prevented him from becoming a pilot, he joined Adolf Hitler's personal bodyguard regiment instead. As Hitler launched his invasion of the Soviet Union, Skorzeny was back on the front lines, fighting with elite SS units. As the Nazis pushed closer to Moscow, Skorzeny received orders from Hitler himself. He was to capture several key Communist Party buildings and the NKVD headquarters. This would have afforded the German military with huge amounts of valuable intelligence and bid a devastating blow to Soviet fighting morale. But Skorzeny's greatest prize was the sluice gates to the Moscow Canal. Hitler had plans to open the sluice gates wide and let all of Moscow flood, turning the Soviet capital into a lake. Fortunately for the Soviets, the German advance began to falter and then halt, 
far too valuable to be lost on the Eastern Front, Otto Skorzeny was ordered back to Germany after being hit in the back of the head by shrapnel. Healing from his injuries, Skorzeny had nothing but time on his hands, time that he used to contemplate his previous orders to capture important communist buildings, the Soviet secret police headquarters and the Moscow Canal sluice gates. Skorzeny felt that the German military lacked units specialized in such forms of unconventional warfare and began to develop theories on waging unconventional warfare deep behind enemy lines. He studied historical partisan movements and spoke with experienced infantry and paratrooper commanders. In a time before special forces, Otto Skorzeny was developing the first modern plan for a special operations task force. Skorzeny's task force would operate deep behind enemy lines and use subterfuge, espionage, and intelligence rather than brute force to achieve its objectives. By Skorzeny's accounting, a small team of specialized commandos could easily accomplish more than an entire company of infantry could. He was only too right, as British commandos were already training and preparing for deployment behind enemy lines on mainland Europe. The powers that be were slow to listen to Skorzeny, however, at least until British commandos began raiding behind enemy lines in Europe to devastating success. To even his staunchest critics, Skorzeny was quickly proved right. A small team of elite soldiers could in fact accomplish far more than entire companies of infantry could. Skorzeny's name was quickly put forward to command Nazi Germany's first true special operations training schools, and soon he was made commander of the Waffen-Sonderverband ZBV Freidenthal Special Forces Unit. Germany may not have been short on syllables, but they were short on allies, and one of Skorzeny's unit's first missions was to parachute behind enemy lines in Iran and contact local tribes. It was hoped that tribal members in Iran could be incited to attack Allied supply lines to the Soviet Union, which despite its massive manpower was almost completely reliant on American supplies for its war effort. Luckily for the Soviets, the effort was deemed unsuccessful when most of the tribes contacted refused to take part in raids. Skorzeny's next efforts, however, would be much more fruitful for Nazi Germany. After Mussolini's ousting from power by the Italian Grand Council of Fascism, Hitler knew that the Italian king would declare an armistice with the Allies. This would be a major setback for the German war effort as Italy had forced considerable resources to be dedicated to the Mediterranean by the Allies. It also threatened his links to oil supply routes in the Middle East and would give Allied aircraft access to German's southern flank if Italy allowed Allied warplanes to be stationed on its territory. Thankfully, the mighty Alps made an overland invasion of Germany from Italy all but impossible, but still Mussolini had to be restored to power, and there was only one man who could get the job done. Locating Mussolini was not easy, as the Italians feared that the Germans would doubtlessly launch a rescue. Hesitant to simply hand him over to the Allies as no armistice had been declared yet, the Italian government had hoped to use Mussolini as a bargaining chip as it sued for peace. To keep the German rescue effort at bay, the Italians moved Mussolini from location to location, making him difficult to track. For weeks, Scorzani and some of his most trusted men worked the streets of major Italian cities, gathering intelligence and intercepting radio messages. Scorzani made free use of counterfeit British pounds, created in yet another unconventional Nazi war plan to defeat the Allies, to bribe Italian officials, and recruit double agents and informants. At last, Mussolini was located, and a rescue plan could be put into effect. But rescuing Mussolini would be one of the riskiest operations of World War II. Fully aware of a plot to rescue their fascist dictator, the Italians had taken great precautions with the imprisonment of Mussolini. They moved the dictator to a mountaintop ski resort high in the Apennine Mountains, which could only be accessed by a cable car. The cable car station was itself guarded by Italian infantry, and at the mountaintop resort Mussolini was guarded by 200 elite Carabinieri guards. The resort was in effect a fortress, with only the cable cars leading up to the top of the mountain. Any troops attempting to use the cars would be slaughtered long before they got a chance to disembark. Rescue would be impossible. But the Italians never counted on the borderline insane daring of Otto Scorzani. Realizing that the only possible way to get to Mussolini would be to avoid the rail cars altogether, Scorzani consulted with some of the best Luftwaffe pilots, and he had one question for them. Could a glider be landed on the grounds of the ski resort, despite the treacherous mountain air currents? Most agreed that technically, yes, it should be possible, but the risk was insane. Unpowered gliders would be completely at the mercy of tumultuous mountain wind currents, and landing room on top of the mountain was already extremely limited. Even if gliders made it safely, it would be a miracle if they stopped in time before tumbling off the edge of the mountain. On the 12th of September 1943, the weather was at last suitable for the attempted rescue, and Otto Skorzeny and his men loaded up onto 10 gliders. Each glider carried a single pilot and 9 soldiers, bringing a total of 90 elite SS troopers to face off against 200 heavily armed 
Italian Carabinieri, but Scorzani had a trump card to play in this gambit. Flying alongside him was General Fernando Soletti, head of the Polizia dell'Africa Italiana, and a respected officer. Scorzani gambled that if caught unawares in a surprise attack and with the presence of a respected Italian officer, the Carabinieri would stand down. He'd soon find out. As the gliders lifted into the air, two companies of German paratroopers launched an attack on the forces holding the cable car station at the base of the mountain. The fighting was fierce, but the Italians were quickly overwhelmed by the far more experienced and capable German troops. Still, not a single German would live to reach the top of the mountain unless Scorzani was successful, and so the troops held their position to prevent Mussolini being moved via the cable cars. The mountain currents made flying treacherous, more so for the unpowered gliders. The bombers towing the first three gliders decided that they needed needed to gain more altitude before releasing the gliders, and thus began long, slow, looping turns to gain altitude. This would threaten the delicate timeline that the operation needed for success, however, and Scorzani ordered the rest of the planes to continue, regardless of the risk to the gliders. If Scorzani could not take and evacuate Mussolini quickly, then more Italian forces would soon be on their way. Released from their two hooks, the gliders shuddered in the tumultuous winds of the Italian mountains. The pilots, amongst some of the best in Nazi Germany, fought the controls to keep the gliders stable and on course. Incredibly, one by one, the German gliders made the almost impossible landing on the tiny tabletop shelf of land at the top of the mountain. Although one of the last to arrive crashed, severely injuring many of its occupants. Leaping from the gliders, though, the bulk of Scorzini's force was soon running toward the hotel. Scorzini had given his men a strict order. Not a single one of them was to open fire unless Scorzini opened fire first. If Scorzini was injured or died, then one of his officers would be the first to open fire. It was critical that the assault force capture Mussolini without having to fight the 200 strong Italian defenders. With General Fernando Soletti ordering the guards to stand down, the Italians laid down their arms and allowed Mussolini to be taken. In less than an hour, one of the riskiest operations of World War II had succeeded without a single shot being fired. Scorzani would be an overnight hero to Nazi Germany and earn his place in the Special Forces Hall of Fame if he survived the final phase of the plan to rescue Mussolini, the escape. German forces would be unable to provide security for Mussolini if they tried to bring him down the mountain and move him by land. Therefore, a small plane was ordered to make the incredible risky landing atop the mountain. This would be Mussolini's ticket off the mountain. But there was a problem. The small plane only had enough power and room for its pilot and one other passenger, and Scorzani refused to leave Mussolini out of his sight. The pilot argued with Scorzani, telling him that there was little chance that the plane could hit the required speed for liftoff if it were carrying the weight of the three men. Scorzani refused to budge. Mussolini was his personal responsibility, and he would be the one to see him brought before the Führer himself. Then Scorzani pointed out the obvious. If the airplane required velocity to generate lift and the takeoff area was too short, then it would simply have to gain speed by falling off the side of the mountain. Scorzani climbed aboard the tiny plane alongside Mussolini, and under the threat of being shot, ordered the pilot to take off. The tiny plane sputtered to life and began to roll toward the edge of the mountain, slowly picking up speed. As the precipice loomed before them, the pilot's worst fears were realized. The plane could not take off overburdened as it was. The wheels soon left the ground as the plane pitched over the mountainside. By some miracle, however, the plane shuttered its way back to horizontal after a brief dive. Against all odds, Scorzani had pulled off one of the most daring rescue operations in history. Otto Scorzani would go on to achieve great success during the waning days of World War II, cementing his place as one of Nazi Germany's most dangerous soldiers. The man became an international special forces legend legend, and most of his training and operational methods would go on to influence or be outright adopted by special forces programs around the world. Perhaps most surprising of all, however, would be Scorzani's eventual role as a Mossad agent working for the Israeli secret organization and helping bring Nazi war criminals to justice. Now check out What If Hitler Had Won, or click this other video instead.